friends uh, welcome to the 72nd session of legal empowerment through interaction lecture series the journey of discovery empowerment and exposure to different thoughts different new vistas and frontiers of uh, legal thoughts we continue and it has been a wonderful journey with all of us together now it has become an like ramachan sir was saying that uh, afternoon sleep we are forfeiting because we would like to be in the company of those persons whom we love for the travel has been there for 72 days continuously now today we have a wonderful speaker who had enthralled us earlier also with his mastery over uh, arbitration today something that we would like ourselves to be exposed to something entirely new maybe uh it it could be said that it is a uh, old wine in new bottle but the new bottle is with new wine it seems like it is dr amit jot he will be addressing on commercial courts act and examination of mandatory processes and timelines we recognize the presence of justice k ramkumar and today we have somebody behind whom we have been for quite some time very elusive in the sense like he tried to escape but this time we caught him. to introduce the topic we have honorable justice and anand venkatesh sir over to you thank you thank you uh thank you so much uh, sham at last you got me so actually i will have to start by saying that uh, i have been uh, very regularly following uh, the webinar series uh, that is going on in uh, Uh, that is conducted by you, and uh, it was such a marvelous journey for me because the speakers which you have called on the standard of uh, discussion that uh, happens during a webinar series is quite high. I must say that because I watch almost all the webinars uh, throughout the country, I must say that there is a very very uh, a great standard that is maintained in your webinars. Uh, watching Justice Nagamuthu, Professor Paul, uh, Justice Ram Kumar, uh, Justice uh, 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 Naidu, uh, uh, it's a with Menon. It's a. I, I thought that the list of people that you have who have addressed this were remarkable. So I always thought that it is better to maintain a low profile here. Uh, than to get in and get exposed so uh, sort of i was having a, a, a sort of a, a, a hesitation to get in because see what happens is that uh, just imagine this scenario sometimes i think every one of you would have experienced this when uh, you have a, a headphone with you and you listen to some jesudas or kishor kumar or uh, rafi and when you walk along by hearing it and when you start singing along with it you think that you also sound like kishore kumar you also sound like jesudas and all that but the man who is coming next to you will know we will be suffering from what you are doing actually so so it's it's the same way what happens is that when we hear to such lucid but very high quality lectures of uh, the speakers who come in and address here and we also take notes when we attempt to make the same speech or when we attempt to address the same issue we get exposed badly that way it's not that easy it's it's very important that when we get into some webinar and address people it's better that we don't just scratch the surface it's better that we do our homework we have some sort of an experience in that only thereafter we will be able to really deliver it or else one will get very badly exposed uh when the when the uh, call was uh, given to me to address this um i thought uh, that i didn't want to sound like a singer who is uh, hearing to jesudas and uh, thinking that he is also a jesudas so straight away i would want to concede uh, that uh, that i i got in only to have this experience of getting involved into a webinar series where a lot of standard is being uh, maintained and um, i would want to in fact get exposed because i thought that's the best way to learn 
that's the best way to learn something new so having said that let me now get into the uh, the subject which you have given me uh, to introduce uh, i was a bit involved during the process of uh, preparing the draft bill and all that as an advocate uh, i was uh, involved in that uh, justice paul had formed a team here and i was part of the team when we uh, discussed uh, the various uh, uh, the scope of the various provisions in this act so to that extent i was exposed and uh, uh, see this act according to me initially should have contested for the longest title that could have been given for an enactment this act initially used to be called as the commercial court commercial division and commercial appellate division of high court act 2015 it will take to 5 minutes for you to complete saying the entire enactment itself so that's how it used to be called fortunately it was rechristened in the year 2018 and it is now called as the commercial courts act 2015 see basically the image of india was uh, taking a huge hit in the international arena because of the notoriety in the delay that is uh, caused in resolving commercial disputes and uh, in 2003 this idea was uh, mooted by the law commission if i am right the 188th report of the law commission is got mooted and uh, as usual the journey from 2003 to 2009 nothing happened in 2009 the commercial division of high court bill 2009 was introduced and that was passed in the lok sabha so from 2003 it took 5 years for a bill to come to the lok sabha in 2009 to be passed in lok sabha everyone was happy but then the story ended there again it was sent to the rajya sabha rajya sabha members raised some very very tricky questions about the whole enactment and basically uh, among other things they were saying that you are trying to give a five star accommodation or a five star treatment to big business people and you don't care about the common man you want to dispose of cases of uh, rich persons but you don't care about the common man so such type of uh, 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 questions were raised by the rajya sabha so what happens immediately we form a committee so it was referred to the committee so it goes to the committee and there it stays again in 2015 so 2003 to 2009 then 2009 to 2015 again it was in cold storage committee discussion this that everything was going on and 2015 the it went to the law commission law commission gave uh, submitted its report and i think it's a 253rd report of the law commission so the this became a uh, uh, an enactment in 2015 uh, so it came in with effect from 2015 with the name which i initially said um, the whole concept of this enactment is that uh, the commercial disputes uh, will have to be disposed of in a time bound manner by special courts that seems to be the whole concept of this commercial courts act the whole purpose of this act see what happened was uh, in 2015 what was contemplated was only a commercial division in the high court with a high pecuniary value and what was happening was all of a sudden the government realizes that uh, the world bank ranks countries only based on certain parameters one of the important parameters through which they want they rank a country is in so far as india is concerned is by looking at the way in which commercial disputes are resolved at a district level in two cities that is in delhi and in bombay all of a sudden the law makers realized that nothing was filed at the district level because the act never contemplated something to be done at the district level the act only contemplated a commercial division in the concerned high courts so therefore immediately with, along with many amendments in 
2018 amendment also brought in by reducing the pecuniary jurisdiction to 3 lakhs from 1 crore it reduced it to 3 lakhs then came in the concept of a commercial court at a district level district judge level and below the district judge level also that is how it came into being so india wanted to really uh, uh, improve its ranking uh, in, the, in the eyes of the world bank so therefore certain amendments again came in the year 2018 so there are four things which are which are found to be of importance in this enactment one is the ease with which a business can be done in this country number two is the enforcement of contract between parties number three is time bound proceedings and number four is it must provide for a very limited appeal so as you find in that only one appeal is provided and there is no further appeal after that so these are the four important criteria or four important uh, features i would say behind this commercial courts um, act so if you look at the act as it is um i should say that the act only contains something like 23 sections out of which one section is already gone effectively there are only 21 sections which you have to go through in this act so as it is the it is not a very complicated act and that was one reason why i was emboldened to introduce the act to you also today so it had just 21 uh, uh, sections basically the jurisdiction of the commercial courts is dealt with under section 6 of this act and what is important in section 6 are these two words one is what is a commercial dispute and two is a specified value these are the two terms which are very important to understand under section 6 of the act which decides the jurisdiction of a commercial court and if you see the phraseology in section 6 it makes it very clear that the commercial dispute and specified value should be read conjunctively it should be read conjunctively so both the conditions one is defined under section 21c of the act which is the commercial dispute the other is defined under section 21i of the act which is the specified value so what is a commercial dispute if you look into the definition of a commercial dispute it is listing totally 21 clauses there are 22 but 21 are the specified clauses which says what a commercial dispute is and if you look at it it's a very exhaustive definition and clause 22 merely gives a scope to the government to add or notify any other commercial dispute to this definition so whatever comes within these 21 clauses under the definition of a commercial dispute are the ones which are the are the disputes which can be tried which where the jurisdiction is vested under section 6 of the act so supreme court uh, in this case of uh, kanla court uh, case in 2018 uh, it held that each of these 22 sub clauses constitute a single neat pigeon hole single neat pigeon hole so you have to understand each and every one of them of course uh, our court in madras high court had uh, had also taken and that was was taken by many of the other high courts also where they said that when you are interpreting this provision it has to be interpreted and it has to be assigned a very wide meaning every every clause should be assigned a very wide meaning so that's how a commercial dispute is defined under section 21 c and the specified value is the value that has been stated in section 21 i uh between 2015 and 2018 that is exactly from 2310 2015 to 35 2018 the specified value was 1 crore then from 35 2018 onwards i said that there was an amendment in the year 2018 so from 35 2018 onwards the specified value was brought down to 3 lakhs so since it was brought down to 3 lakhs now 
we have four types of courts which needs to be established under this act one is the commercial court at the district level second is the commercial court below the district court level then third is a commercial division in the high courts which have original jurisdiction see there are totally five courts which have original five high courts which have original jurisdiction in this country as we all must be knowing one is madras second is bombay third is calcutta fourth is delhi and fifth is himachal pradesh these are the five high courts which have original jurisdiction so it contemplated a commercial division to be established in each of these high court which has this original jurisdiction and then the fourth category is the commercial appellate division where an appeal is contemplated as so these are the four courts which are to be established and this has got the assent of the president and uh, so what is this act do uh, i would not want to really uh, encroach upon the area that is going to be addressed by the speaker by getting into the provisions and all that because he is in a better position to do it Uh, because in so far as my exposure to commercial courts act is concerned i have to be very frank with you i was involved at the time when the process was going on for 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 getting this act uh, uh, coming into uh, force and thereafter as an advocate i filed two cases but i did not complete the whole thing by then i was dragged to the bench i became a judge here and after becoming a judge i have not sat on the commercial division till now so therefore i know the theory portion of it the theory part of it in the commercial courts act but i always thought that it is better that a person who has a practical exposure who has who, who has done cases he will be in a better position to really explain and the today's speaker you can you cannot get a better person than the today's speaker who will do it so what did this provision do what is what did this act do see this act is nothing but tweaking of certain provisions under cpc it is a miniature form of civil procedure code tweaking of certain provisions of cpc see with this act the substantive law is left untouched the same transfer of property continues the same specific relief act continues the same sale of goods act continues the same contract act continues the same patent law continues everything continues so the substantive law is the same and what happened in what 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 comes out of this act is some amendments were made to the cpc for a faster adjudication and disposal of cases this is the whole thing that has uh, that has happened in this act and section 16 of this act it enabled the amendments to be done in cpc and the commercial court and the commercial division will have to follow this amended cpc which prevails over everything else that's what has happened and to be precise if i am right there are three sections in cpc and 10 orders in cpc which were amended and brought in here that's all that's what has happened in this uh, whole enactment and it starts from the pleadings to the case management to the uh, summary judgment etc etc i am sure uh, the speaker is going to address us on all those things so therefore i don't want to get into the nitty gritties of what were the provisions that were that were tweaked and what were brought in under the commercial court act uh, the only thing which i wanted to say is that in my personal opinion this is a very very important enactment which is now at the stage of infancy see this infant must be allowed to grow and it will grow only if we as advocates and judges follow it in letter and spirit and this act will have to grow into a matured adult so if this act grows into a matured adult then what happens is that the success of this act the success of having having operated with this act will be a precursor for all the future civil litigations because if that happy percolates into our system the courts start having a easy hand in dealing with such disputes it will become more easier in future to amend the cpc also 
wherein such fast track uh, disposals can be brought in even under cpc and we will find it even more easier to dispose it of so therefore uh, it's very important that we hold this infant enactment carefully and make it a mature adult so that it is going to really help the or uh, change the whole of our attitude on civil litigations in this country so i would say that if that happens there are two more advantages which will come out and with that i will uh, end up i find that the arbitration it's true that the arbitration act has really picked up in this country and all that but i find by carefully watching as to how it is happening fundamentally there is a difficulty in getting arbitrators with sterling character it's 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 very important that we recognize that fact unless and otherwise the arbitrators are coming from an institution institutionalized arbitrators sometimes it becomes very important if you get arbitrators with questionable integrity because a questionable integrity and intelligence according to me is a deadly combination he knows how to pass an award and with the way in which 34 is drafted and it has been interpreted by the honorable supreme court even though the honorable supreme court uses the word pigeon hole for each and every one of those grounds on which it can be challenged i think that even a sparrow cannot enter into through these pigeon holes it is that difficult to really challenge uh, an award of an arbitrator. and i also find that there is an undue enrichment by advocates as well as some of the arbitrators at the cost of the litigants so in my personal view the arbitration as it is going on today in this country uh, is not very encouraging so therefore if commercial courts are effectively going to function now commercial courts uh, jurisdiction has gone up to the, uh, the level of 3 lakhs if it is really going to function well if they if uh, if time bound disposals are going to be ensured i am sure that people rather than preferring arbitration will prefer to go before commercial courts in order to resolve their disputes so this is one more important area where we have to ensure that that the commercial courts uh, this enactment becomes a success in this country so uh, without uh, uh, going very much into the provisions of the act which i want the speaker to address uh, i am also eager to hear what he says and at the end of the program probably i have one or two things to pitch in on the appeal provision that has been given in this in the act that there is some confusion so that we will address it at the end so thank you so much uh, and uh, the speaker can thank you thank you justice uh, anand venkatesh sir for setting the stage for the entry of dr amit george over to you you are anxious to hear from me uh, thank you so much sir uh, at the outset thank you so much to justice uh, venkatesh i am deeply honored that uh, he he took the time today to give an introduction to the topic in fact on an a side i had the pleasure of listening to lordships in a webinar where he had done on contemporary trends in law march of law and over a two hour period we were all enthralled by the sheer scope of uh, the discussion which he launched and the areas of law which he touched upon so it's only his humility when he says that you know that uh, he is not so aware of the practical working of the act uh, that's only his humility speaking but thank you once again sir for uh, the introduction uh, now uh, just just to start out with the act as justice uh, venkatesh also pointed out this is an act which is primarily in its infancy at the moment and uh, this is an act which came in 2015 and as he pointed out and we are now in 2020 with an amendment already effected in the year 2018 so for a lot of the provisions the judicial interpretation is something which is uh, to a large extent not very concrete right now it's still fluid but there are certain sections which have witnessed a lot of contestation and consequently a lot of adjudication by the bench now uh, in terms of how i plan to proceed today i don't really intend to take a look at 
the scheme of the act as a whole or an overview of the act as such what i intend to focus on is the if i may use the term shock therapy that the act brings in now uh, the reason why i use this term is because as justice venkatesh also pointed out the very uh, in uh, the very initial uh, germination of the act or the reason for bringing it into effect was essentially to completely overhaul the process of civil trial in the country now uh, it can be maybe you know uh, let's say at the cost of some uh, political symbolism be equated to say the bullet train process so therefore a normal civil trial is something what you see in as the normal trains running but the commercial courts act was intended to put in place a special mechanism for an expedited trial so akin to a bullet train which would take you to the destination of the degree or the final culmination of the proceedings in a much faster way as also dedicated infrastructure which would be available only to this stream of adjudication thus also ensuring faster disposal now what i intend to focus on today are certain mandatory timelines and processes that this act brings into play see it's always very nice when we read about an end result nobody will ever complain about being told that a trial will be over say in 2 years or that a, uh, a litigation is going to be ended in say one fifth the time that a normal civil litigation takes in this country everybody is very happy with the end result but what we must also appreciate is that with efficiency with expediency and with speed there also comes the concurrent obligation to put in place processes that are very exacting and require a far greater degree of exactitude on the part of legal professionals so i say this from experience because once this act came into being and i started receiving my first briefs for commercial court matters i was completely taken aback by the kind of methodology that this act had put into place so a lot of the things you know which you inculcate over the years once you see civil litigation you see the ctc you see a few litigations to inculcate some sort of you know the basic principle or basic responses if i may call it that as a lawyer to different stages of a suit and over a period of time a lot of these responses become stereotypical in nature because you keep doing it day in and day in and day out so of course the facts change the application of law may change but procedurally a lot of us therefore suffer from the inertia of being comfortable with something now uh, the commercial courts act is nothing but you know comfortable in that sense because it brings into effect a lot of radical changes which are then mandatory in nature meaning thereby that if you do not adapt to the new reality there is a very real chance of there being a catastrophic end to a litigation against the interests of your client so uh, without sounding like a doomsday prophet my entire emphasis is going to be today therefore on these provisions because they represent as justice venkatesh also pointed out one of the most radical overhauls of our civil trial system in the country i mean the 2002 amendments to the cpc were deemed to be revolutionary but those are nothing compared to how far these particular this particular legislation go now with that uh, particular broad overview in mind uh, if i may just request uh, sham sir to kindly permit screen sharing so i can just put across a powerpoint to make it easier to be able to refer to the various uh, 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 can you just make a request because the icon here is missing i don't know yeah so i i am clicking on share screen it says that host disabled participant screen sharing so possibly there is an option there i can of course continue with the pvt which i have here but i think it's the screen it will be easier to no, no it won't ever come can you just mail to me right now if i mean i am working on it if it doesn't work i can just play it for you sure, sure. what i will do is i'll just email it to you Yeah. and uh, in the interregnum i'll of course uh, continue on the side fine fine uh, now uh, what is really required uh, to uh, understand as justice venkatesh also pointed out with this uh, particular act is that it essentially came in response to what was the abysmal ranking which india as a country had in the global rankings in terms of enforcement in terms of ease of business in terms of fidelity to contracts etc now a large part of this problem was obviously driven by the sheer delay 
which was actually occurring in our ability to be able to conduct litigation at a quick, on a quick uh, process now therefore the act essentially tries to take into account or tries to uh, remedy a situation whereby we have ineffective processes which have resulted in such a position now uh, in order to essentially understand what is ineffective ineffectiveness here is construed from two angles hardware and software now when i say hardware i intend to refer to our abysmal level of appointment of judges now essentially the hardware is also something which is required to be taken into account because even if you have the best provisions possible unless you have the manpower to be able to effectively deal with the number of cases it is going to be very difficult for you to be actually able to apply that software which is represented in the commercial courts act effectively now this is a significant problem and so before i come to the provisions this is one reason why a lot of us believe that the commercial courts act at the moment may not be an effective alternative say to arbitration for the simple reason that to give a practical example i was appearing before a commercial court in hyderabad last year and uh, the learned judge had on his board 65 matters for that day all commercial matters now uh, unfortunately despite the provisions in the act which we will come to expecting a human being no matter how learned how intelligent or how hard working to essentially dispose of 65 matters in the time of timeline which the act contemplates is humanly impossible now therefore the earlier conceptualization of the commercial courts act had a specific provision which pertained to a minimum allocation of cases or i'm so sorry a maximum allocation of cases and which basically said that there would be a review of the number of cases which were pending before a particular judge and that when that number of cases got exceeded then automatically a another judge would then be added to the fray or added to the roster so that the distribution would happen now unfortunately this is something which is not there in the act therefore even though we have a lot of provisions which call for expedite expedited trial the hardware for this that is the requisite number of judges is lacking till date and which is why again on the pessimistic side Uh, a former chief justice of india in a public function remarked that uh, unfortunately the way the appointments have gone uh, the commercial courts act has only resulted essentially in the name plate outside the particular judges chamber being changed and a brand new you know frame or a brand new board with golden letters saying commercial court has been fixed and it has been put outside the chamber so of course that's uh, maybe a slightly pessimistic view Slightly rhetorical view, but this is one of the significant disadvantages that the software is inherently married to the hardware, which, as on date, is woefully lacking in our country. So that's not really changed. Now, uh, with that uh, particular uh, element in mind, that broad background in mind, we may uh, start with the uh, with the essential uh, merits of the topic. So I'll just request uh, Po. Po, are you there? If you can please forward the slide. I've just sent you the latest version. If you may kindly forward that to uh, Sham sir, so that you know he can then do the screen sharing. Now, uh, as and when that happens, uh, uh, so the entire purpose of the Commercial Courts Act is to ensure a specialized ecosystem for the adjudication of defined commercial disputes of a specified value. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, what constitutes a commercial dispute, etc., just as Venkatesh has already dealt with in brief. and that is not really something which i intend to get into for the particular presentation because the onus is going to be on specialized requirements as opposed to say the definition of a commercial dispute or the the applicability of the code to a particular litigation now the first thing which one must keep in mind is that the commercial courts act has been held by various high courts to be a complete code in itself now this is important because even though it sounds very cliche something which is used for a lot of statutes now what is important to understand is that the commercial courts act is a complete code therefore it is going to be very difficult to rely on or make reference to other litig or to other statutes to try and postulate rights which otherwise don't explicitly flow procedurally from the commercial courts act 
Now, the practical effects of this we will come to when we go to the individual provisions, including most importantly Section 13, which is the appellate provision, which Justice Minkatesh also noted that he would be speaking about towards the end of the talk. Now, therefore, please bear in mind Commercial Courts Act is a complete code in itself. Yes, it has independent provisions. Yes, there are certain provisions by means of which it affects certain amendments to the CPC. But if you are in a commercial dispute before a commercial court, procedurally, the Commercial Courts Act is the statute which is applicable exclusively, unless specifically opined to the contrary in the statute. Now, also, as Justice Venkatesh pointed out, that the general tenor of judgments by the court so far has been to give as wide an interpretation as possible to the terms of the Commercial Courts Act, so as to ensure that there will be an effective translation of its basic aims and ideals into the practical sphere. Because uh, for a lot of uh, you know statutes, even though the act itself is born from a particular normative direction in mind, the actual implementation of the act takes a completely different. Now, for instance, under the 1940 Arbitration Act, one of the main reasons why we had the 1996 Arbitration Act brought into operation was because even though there were a lot of stringent provisions under the 1940 Act, a liberal interpretation of the same had led to complete havoc. Now, uh, uh, I mean, uh, slightly dilating from the topic, a lot of people talk about landmark judgments in arbitration, but ask any arbitration practitioner and their understanding of maybe one of the most landmark judgments of the Supreme Court, which they will say effectively saved the Arbitration Act, is the relatively unknown judgment of the Supreme Court in popular construction company, which basically held that the time limit under Section 34 was mandatory in nature and could not be extended at all beyond the 90 day plus 30 day period. So, you know, it sounds uh, not something which is, you know, very fascinating or something very important, but that one judgment effectively saved a lot of evils, which would have otherwise entered the 1996 Act adjudication also, which happened to the 1940 Act. So the, the, the courts, the Supreme Court, for instance, Ambalal Sarabhai has made it very clear that you need to effectively adjudicate and interpret the provisions of the act to ensure that the usual procedural delays which plague our traditional legal system are not recognized. Now, therefore, that of course is the broad overarching normative uh, background. Now, uh, if I may request for the next slide, please. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's jump straight away into what are the mandatory provisions which we will now have to be careful about in relation to the Commercial Courts Act. Now, uh, the first provision which really comes to mind in that sense, so of course, we will have Section 8 also, but I want to deal with that when it comes to Section 13, is Section 12A. Now, Section 12A is part of the amendments which were brought in in the year 2018. 12A essentially says that unless you are seeking urgent relief in your commercial suit, say you are asking for a stay, some interim order, injunction, etc. If there is no urgent relief, let me take an example, there is a suit for recovery. Then Section 12A now makes it mandatory that before you can actually file a commercial suit, you need to go for pre-institution mediation. Now, there are also commercial court mediation rules which have been put into place by the legislature, by the executive which essentially lay down an entire methodology for the legal services authority of the concerned area to undertake this pre-institution mediation. So why is this important? It is important because as an advocate, if one is approached to file a commercial matter, which is not urgent in nature, if you rush ahead and file the matter without taking recourse to the pre-institution mediation, then effectively your suit is not maintainable on that ground. Therefore, it is very important to bear in mind that in terms of Section 12A, you are required to undertake a pre-institution mediation process and which for which there are timelines, three months, further extendable by two months, etc. 
you also get that leeway in terms of the limitation period. So that is a very self-sustained, a very holistically designed provision. I must reiterate that the constitutional validity of this provision is currently undergoing challenge before the High Court of Delhi. And that list is currently uh, sub judice before the court. But as of today, there is no stay on the provision. So therefore, if you do not have an interim relief being sought, please bear in mind, go, you need to go for compulsory, mandatory, pre-institution mediation before you can actually maintain the suit in court. Now, moving on from 12A, when you have a order, an interlocutory order or an interim order passed by any court, because of various developments in the law, for instance, the judgment of the Supreme Court in Babu Lal Khinji, etc., there was a very enhanced or expanded scope for the possibility of you filing an appeal or a revision to challenge any interlocutory order passed by a commercial court. Now, under Section 8 of the Commercial Courts Act, this is specifically barred. Therefore, your only recourse can be to Section 13 of the Commercial Courts Act, which we will come to. So, even though this will shut out any, let's say, right you had under Section 8 in terms of an interlocutory challenge under the normal provisions of the CPC or, say, Babulal Khimji, it still does not shut out the inherent power of the High Court constitutionally under Article 227 of the Constitution. So subject to that one rider or that one caveat, there is going to be a complete bar on a civil revision application or any petition against an interlocutory order of a commercial court because of Section 8 of the Commercial Court. Now, if you may just go to the next slide, we will then come up against appeals. Yeah, okay. I think somebody is being very artistic on the <laughs> PowerPoint presentation. We, yeah, I we have a very, very talented crowd. So uh, uh, Right, right, right. Okay. So, one yeah. Second, I mean, one second. I can yeah. just remove it. One yeah, yeah, no difficulty. Uh, can I just enable your... Now it is working. I am enabling your uh, uh, sharing of slides. Ah, perfect. Perfect. So that will be great. There yes, was some yes. technical hits. Now it's working. Right. Yeah, uh, I hope the slide is uh, visible. Uh, not yet. Yeah, wonderful. Right now, yes. Okay. Perfect, sir. Right. So now, uh, when we come to the appeals provision, now this is controversial because as Justice Venkatesh also pointed out, the Commercial Courts Act takes a value judgment call. The Commercial Courts Act says there is going to be a provision only for one level of appeal. Now, to a lot of us, even for me initially, when, you, when we see this provision, it seems a little harsh. And why that is so, we will come to it. So, it provides for only one remedy of appeal or one level of appeal, which is to be exercised by the party concerned within a period of 60 days from the date of the judgment. Now, where it becomes complicated is Section 13, if you see the text, limits the ability to maintain an appeal only against orders or judgments of two kinds. One, orders and judgments which are specifically recognized under Order 43 of the CPC, which is of course a very limited, uh, let's say, enumeration, or those under Section 37 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, which are similarly very limited in nature. So now the difficulty is when you come to an order or when you come to a judgment, you will necessarily have to look at it from the scope of either order 43 or section of the CPC or section 37 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Now, why is this a huge change from the status quo? See, in many high courts, we have letters patent. In many high courts, we have the High Courts Act, which independently provide a right of appeal. In many high courts, the considered position consistently over decades is that the test laid down by the Supreme Court in the judgment in Shah Babu Lal Khimji, which of course has a very liberal reading of what is an appealable order. All of these provisions, individual to different courts or different high courts, 
are now overridden by section 30. Now, uh, on the lighter side, if anyone ever did an empirical study of judgments which have resulted in maximum litigation in the country, Babulal Khimji will definitely find place of pride in that list. Because the amount of litigation it has permitted, and I do not mean this in a negative or a pejorative sense, correctly so, is now going to be completely whittled down by section 13 of the Commercial Court Act. And there is also a lot of precedent at the moment to support such a now, we will come to that, but before that, I would just like to make a clarification that if your appeal was instituted prior to the Commercial Courts Act having been brought into force, then the Section 13 will not be given any retrospective application. So that let's be very clear about the, the let's say, the limitations which are imposed by Section 13 are in that sense not intended to be uh, retrospective in nature. Now, forgetting retrospectivity for a moment, let's come to a situation where it actually does apply. Let's say it applies. There is no dispute on that. In that case, the judicial precedent till date has veered towards a very narrow reading of the scope of Section 13. So the High Court of Delhi in multiple decisions has taken the view that Section 13 has to be interpreted very narrowly and appeals can only be maintained against orders which are specifically enumerated under Order 43 CPC or Section 37 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Now, I must add a caveat. The Delhi High Court in some recent judgments has, has opened up a slightly wider scope of appeal by referring to certain specific rules and regulations in the High Court original side rules. So that will not have universal application, but I must add a caveat when I'm making a proposition. But the Delhi High Court recently, in the last two, three months, has delivered two judgments, two division pen judgments. Unfortunately, those are not there explicitly, but I think the Superon is one of them. Has taken the view that certain orders which emanate from hours rendered under the High Court original side rules might still be maintainable he holds the provision of Section 13. But this is a view which has been taken in the specific context of the Delhi High Court original side rules and therefore cannot be said to have general application in terms of, say, uh, the CPC or to other courts, which is why I'm not dealing with it for the moment. But for those who are interested, they may kindly go through those judgments. Now, uh, the Bombay High Court view is interesting to understand because that is one way where, where will one will see shift in view. So unlike the Delhi High Court, the Bombay High Court originally, in one of the first judgments interpreting this provision in Hub Town Limited, took a very broad view of what 13 means. So the Bombay High Court in Hub Town relied on Shah Babul Al Khimji and said that if you met the test under Shah Babul Al Khimji, then you could still maintain an appeal under Section 13 1. Now, the Bombay High Court in Space Tech Equipments subsequently, however, said that letters patent as available to the Bombay High Court would not have any application in the case of a commercial dispute and that any independent right which it purportedly might give to a party of appeal would be overridden by the Commercial Court Act. Now, the High Court then moved completely to the strict view in its judgment in Maharana Pratap Education Center, where it held that consequent to the judgment of the Supreme Court in Kandla Export Corporation, where such a view was reiterated, the earlier judgment of the Bombay High Court in Hubtown was no longer good law. Therefore, in Maharana Pratap Education Center, the High Court then took a view which is similar to what the Delhi High Court articulated by saying that Section 13 in this sense is a complete code and therefore you cannot maintain appeals on the earlier paradigms or the earlier benchmarks such as Shah Babu Lal Khimji. Now, this is important to understand because you will be surprised at the kind of orders which are now not appealable to a division bench. So I am talking from the context of a, a High Court practitioner as a trial court lawyer, that Article 227, you know, option is still to a certain extent available to a practitioner. But as somebody practicing on the original side, this is a matter of concern for me if I am appearing, say, for the losing party. Because now, because of Section 13, at least in the Delhi High Court, you know, uh, my right to file an appeal 
the maintainability of an appeal is severely circumscribed but that circumscription also from the point of view of a litigant or from the point of view of a trial might actually be a very positive development because you are now not able to go up in appeal against every or you know all and sundry orders and therefore delay the trial in case so of course like i mentioned earlier all of these provisions have a cost as an advocate obviously i have <laughs> i may have a slightly more subjective opinion on this but uh, this is something you know this is the new reality which all of us need to uh, be cognizant of and aware of now this is therefore a matter of uh, significant importance that section 13 limits the right to appeal and not only does it provide for only one appeal it also provides for a very limited scope of identifying what that uh, appeal is so on both grounds section 13 significantly ring fences the ability of a party to be able to you know uh, go to the appellate forum at the interim stage and try and put one or the other roadblock in the manner of how the trial proceeds and as practitioners we are all aware why one well timed appeal even if it is ultimately dismissed if you are able to secure stay in the interregnum there are multiple cases of trials prolonging for years together in fact uh, you know there are there was one case which the supreme court noted an interim stay continued for 14 years till the list was finally decided and uh, the uh, stay was eventually found to be completely honest but 14 years passed in the meantime so therefore this is the evil which section 13 essentially aims to curb but this is something that practitioners need to be aware of so that we are not taken by surprise when an appeal suddenly the other side raises an issue of maintainability and uh, i mean i i suffered this <laughs> sudden raising of maintainability so therefore i am i am uh, speaking from experience now uh, this is therefore something we have to take a look at in terms of section 13 which is venkatesh also mentioned that he would be shedding more light on this and with his vast experience i'm sure that is something which we will all uh, uh, thoroughly uh, enjoy and be enriched by now uh, the section 15 of the act now this is i mean obviously not that relevant in the strict sense 15 articulates the proposition that once you have the commercial courts act in place then necessarily pending matters which fall under the definition will be transferred to the competent commercial court now uh, if you are uh, let's say in a high court this may not have such a big impact because ultimately there is going to be a transfer within the same court but in a lot of states where there is no original jurisdiction for as uttar pradesh you will have a case where there is only one commercial court in a particular district they will not be you know uh, multiple courts in the sense of the jurisdiction and in fact uh, in up there are many cases where the transfer actually is happening to courts many many kilometers away hundreds of kilometers away so i had a matter where uh, i had a matter before uh, a particular uh, trial court uh, in uttar pradesh which was supposed to argue and after having argued it for days on end eventually the matter has now gotten transferred to agra so uh, earlier you know <laughs> we were going to uh, district court on a completely opposite end of the state so these are some of the logistical issues but one has to be aware that once the commercial court act comes into operation there is going to be a deep transfer of all of these matters to the commercial division uh, depending of course on the kind of jurisdiction which the particular high court enjoy now uh, uh, so now effectively in addition to the section 154 of the commercial court act lays down very very stringent timelines now uh, we will come to this when we come to the specific orders and sections of the cpc which the commercial courts act effects amendments to uh, but kindly bear in mind that there is a small leeway available for cases which have just gotten transferred for instance you will obviously have filed a suit or filed a written statement in a case which was never under the commercial court act but after the commercial court act comes into play your suit or your proceeding stands transferred so for those proceedings there is a slight leeway given in the sense that since lot of your pleadings or a lot of your actions might not be compliant with the format under the commercial court act or the timelines may have been breached the court has ample discretion in the case of a transferred matter to set new timelines within which these pleadings may be 
that of course is falls within like the fact that you know you cannot be taken by surprise when a new legislation is passed now with this very brief caveat in mind it's now important to turn to the amendments to the cpc so now you have you know a specific tweaking of the software as contained in the code of civil procedure which is otherwise continued you know like pretty much unchanged from the year of its uh, incorporation though of course there were some significant changes made in the year 2002 now uh, see one big issue with a lot of uh, the pleadings is that over a period of time the rigor of the cpc in terms of verification in terms of the identification of what are the specific paragraphs in a pleading which are to the personal knowledge of the deponent which are based on record what are the pleadings which are based on advice given by a counsel etc these were things you know which had over a period of time not been taken with much seriousness because in a lot of cases you would have seen affidavits which simply say you know whatever has been said in the uh, plaint or whatever has been said in the written statement is true to my knowledge or to the record it has been drafted by my advocate on my instructions and they are not being repeated so we had a very standard stock stereotype sort of format in our affidavit or in whatever manner in which we verified the plaint but now by the commercial code act amendment and the introduction of rule 15a in order 6 of the cpc there is a very specific format for the verification of a pleading now primarily if you are filing a suit the affidavit which is filed along with your suit is now referred to as a statement of truth and there is a specific format for a statement of truth which is quite extensive and which contains a specific enumeration of the number of pages which your pleadings has the paragraphs of the pleadings which are based on the witnesses knowledge the paragraphs of the pleadings which are based on legal advice etc etc so that format is provided for under the commercial code act you may see that but that format is something which is far more vigorous in terms of the details it requires as compared to a lot of these you know slightly more stereotypical affidavits and verifications which we were used to doing in the past few years under uh, trials in the cpc now uh, this this particular rigor continues across the board now uh, for instance timeline for filing a written statement now uh, under the cpc always of course you know you had the strict timeline within which you know the uh, written statement had to be filed after the 2002 amendment it became more strict but there was always you know some level of leeway or let's say some level of argumentation with regard to uh, extending the time though of course recent judgments lifted it in the party so the commercial courts act does not leave any sort of confusion in this regard commercial courts act extends the timeline for you to file a written statement from the 90 days which were originally available to a more relaxed timeline of 120 days but the commercial courts act is categorical that beyond the 120 day period the court concerned has absolutely no power to be able to extend this further So the, there are supreme court judgments high court judgments categorically taking this view already that a written statement under the commercial court act must necessarily come within a period of a 120 days therefore please bear in mind 120 days is your lakshman rekha under the commercial court act for filing your written statement if you do not adhere to this then your written statement will not be taken on record now uh, going further just like you have the timeline for a written statement being made very rigorous now the commercial courts act also requires a very specific and unequivocal kind of pleading to be made in a written statement now usually you know in the written statements now which mostly we see and that's across the board applies to all of us Uh, we our written statements are sound more like you know counter affidavits so in a written statement you will have contents are denied contents are admitted as so far as they are a matter of record so we are all guilty of doing that but so the commercial court act says this cannot happen anymore the commercial court act does not permit you to simplicity deny 
ever been made in the plant anymore so there is a far greater level of responsibility and scrutiny which is imported to statements made in the written statement so as is clear from the slide which is only a reproduction of what the amended rule says he the deponent or the person attesting to the written statement the defendant is required to specifically state the allegations which he or she denies allegations which he or she is unable to admit or deny but which the plaintiff is required to prove and a specific third category of allegations which are admitted now more importantly when you now deny an allegation in a plaint you must say so why because earlier under the cpc you could simply say i deny and tomorrow you know you could always modulate your stand at the time of evidence or oral arguments by saying this is what i meant or oh, i actually meant this and you know there is nothing really in concrete to tie you down but now the commercial court act says when you say no you must necessarily postulate your version so if the plaint says both of us met at 4 p to sign a contract you simply can't say i deny you must say no i called you at 4 pm asked you where you were you told me you had no intention of coming that day and therefore we never met and never signed the agreement in question so now you know you can't simply say i deny we'll see it later when the evidence comes or you know when the final argument comes we will see what is the case to be made out so in fact there is a very interesting judgment of uh, justice uh, ajeev sahai and law in the delhi high court where he has uh, discussed this cultural change which has which is supposed to come about as a result of the commercial court act so in a bit tongue in cheek justice and law says that you know most lawyers actually understand what their case is only when th the stage of final arguments is reached so you know your entire stage of pleading issue framing evidence all of this the lawyer is not clear what the case is only at final argument stage you realize oh this is my case and i should argue it so in a sarcastic tone he says that you know in the commercial courts act this liberty you know is not available to practice correctly so because in a written statement which is required to be this specific obviously one must be categorical and unequivocal in terms of what the defendant's case is now this also you know continues to issues of jurisdiction valuation because see a lot of us you know uh, at least when we entered the profession the younger generation a lot of us took recourse to the soft copies of these pleadings or the drafts so therefore in every draft in a written statement there will be necessarily a line say the court doesn't have jurisdiction there will be a line say plaint is barred by limitation and uh, i mean if you if you really copy paste 100% there will be a line saying there is insufficient court fee so and so therefore you will see many orders where at the stage of uh, uh, argument the uh, judge concerned the learned judge concerned will ask what is the what is the deficit and at that stage you know, one has no idea what is the court fee forget about what is the deficit so this is one of the problems which has come about because of computerization that you know there is a mass copying so now with the commercial courts act these copied averments or these stereotypical averments are not worth the paper they are printed on because in the absence of these details it is going to be very difficult for you to be able to as a matter of right articulate these uh, arguments in a way in which it is legally sustainable therefore uh, ultimately in a written statement under the commercial courts act one has to be very very careful because in terms of the new proviso to sub rule 1 of rule 5 if the allegation in the plaint is not denied in the manner it is required to be denied under the commercial courts act then it will be treated as admitted so therefore you know it's not just a case of saying all right i didn't do it what's the big deal there is a provision which now says you will be deemed to be admitting this and that is very very critical when read in conjunction with another provision with regard to summary judgment which we will come to now so, so please bear in mind written statement under the commercial courts act is not something which can be gone through in a stereotypical or superficial manner 
it requires specific pleadings in the manner in which the commercial courts act requires otherwise frankly speaking that everment is not worth it now this of course is something you know which is a significant cultural change for a lot of us and even for people you know practicing say in high courts which otherwise have had a very extensive commercial law practice this does come across as a uh, significant cultural shock and even today i see repeatedly come to me when i see written statements in 2020 which do not follow any of these you know postulates so it's a very embarrassing position later before a learned judge when you know a question is posed as to whether a written statement actually meets the mandates of a commercial courts act or not now uh, moving on from the written statement even when it comes to a plain the commercial courts act requires you to be far more specific with regard to a lot of issues for instance interest now interest is again something which a lot of times in plains you will see is dealt with in a very summary fashion and there will be one paragraph which will say oh please grant me interest at best there will be an enumeration of the rate of interest somebody will say 12% 15% but beyond that what is the date of cause of action what is the date from which you are claiming it up to which date have you calculated it what is the daily rate at which interest will accrue thereafter for the court to award it to you in future etc these sort of finer details usually you will find are not present in plaints so now the commercial courts act requires you if you are claiming interest to delineate and put in writing all of these aspects so rule 2a of order 7 of the cpc is now amended and this is something which you need to do aside from a specific declaration that you are seeking interest in relation to a commercial transaction within the meaning of section 34 of the cpc so please bear this in mind now uh, a similar issue happens with regard to disclosure discovery and inspection now you will find a lot of literature jurisprudentially you will find a lot of judgments which bemoan the lack of effective disclosure and inspection procedures under the indian civil trial uh, process as you will see in western jurisdiction disclosure and inspection is an extremely detailed process and in many cases you will see pursuant to a disclosure discovery and inspection process matters inevitably get settled because once you are able to have a clear view the entire evidence which is available with you and with the counterparty you are at that stage able to make a far more objective analysis of how strong your case is on the merits now therefore in order to be able to further uh bring about a process or a system where disclosure discovery and inspection of documents can be done in a more efficient manner the order 11 of the cpc has been substituted by the commercial courts act putting in place a far more extensive regime for the process of disclosure discovery and inspection now along with the uh, plaint for instance the plaintiff is required to file a list of all documents and photocopies in its power possession control or custody pertaining to the suit now please bear in mind in your statement of truth which you file along with the suit there is also an independent averment that the deponent makes to the effect that all documents in the power possession control relating to the suit relevant to the suit have been filed along with the plaint now if strictly speaking this particular provision requires you to file almost every document in your power and possession the earlier the rule used to be you should not suppress a material document from the court so as long as you know something was not like clearly material or at least something which was not against you clearly the standard of you know what was suppression was a little low but now strictly speaking this rule requires you to file every document possible now practically this creates issues for instance uh, in a plaint relating to say the construction of a power plant which went on for 8 years there may technically be say 5000 emails 10000 emails which were exchanged between the parties now this creates a logical conundrum how can you when you are filing a suit for instance if you are filing a suit for urgent relief 
how can you possibly you know comply with this provision to the t if it requires you to file almost every single document under the sun pertaining to the controversy so there has been a let's say more a holistic or more practical interpretation of this provision to say that the aspect of relevancy still remains and so things which are completely dehors the matter of controversy is something which you might get away with not filing but there is no conclusive authoritative pronouncement so far on what exactly is the element of relevancy in this particular context so therefore that is something which is still open to interpretation but please note that normatively you are required to file all of the documents which are in your power and possession along with the plea now of course there are certain exceptions you know uh, matters pertaining to cross examination matters for pertaining to any issue which is set up by the defendant for the first time after the plea is filed etc there are certain exceptions but please note the disclosure requirement under the commercial courts act is far wider than anything we have ever seen before under the cpc now another very important aspect which again creates a logistical difficulty for a practitioner the list of documents now no longer can simply be an enumeration of the description of the document that's what we always used to say agreement dated so and so now if you file documents under the commercial code sag you are supposed to make an index which contains all these details for each independent document so you are supposed to say for each document is it original is it a photocopy the details of the document the mode of execution issuance or receipt so if you have a document you are supposed to tell the court how did you receive it line of custody so if there's a document with you you're supposed to say defendant sent it to me or some third party sent it to me now in one case where i was dealing with a section 34 challenge under the commercial code sir uh, there were approximately 400 documents which were filed with the section 34 now the person who drafted the 34 said that making the index in man hours took seven times the amount of time which drafting the 34 took because this index is so comprehensive and you have to be so specific that the kind of detail involved is mind boggling so please note the index under the commercial courts act is not our old cedo typical index where you know you have certain description of a document you have a page number and then you are done with it and of course you have a serial number now it's no longer the case so it's extremely so as uh, someone pointed out to me in a lighter tone Uh, therefore lawyers must also be aware that they should you know accordingly charge a higher fee when they have a commercial court act matter <laughs> as compared to a non commercial court matter because these are things you know which will completely take you by surprise in terms of the amount of work involved as a practitioner now therefore there are a long line of these requirements in terms of what the plaint is supposed to do when the documents are being filed along with the plaint and of course as i mentioned you must also have a declaration also contained in the statement of truth that you've not suppressed anything everything's been disclosed and you do not have any other documents etc etc so as not to spend more time on something which is already clear i'm not going into any of the uh, specific individual aspect now i am not repeating what has already been said for the plaint very very similar processes or requirements are also present for the written statement so just as in the new case of a plaintiff you are also required to ensure that all relevant documents are filed subject of course to the relevant exceptions for instance cross examination etc you are also required to give the undertaking that relevant documents are filed and more importantly your list of documents also just like in the case of a plaint must contain all of these details which are required to for the court to be able to come to a conclusion that is this index obviously is in line with what the commercial courts act postulates now what why this is important practically is if you are a defendant you have a timeline of 120 days now on the 119th day you file an index completely bereft of all of this there are judgments which have taken the view that that is a non-est filing which essentially means that you can't fall back on the old 
you know uh, argument that oh i will refile it i get a month more there are now certain judgments which identify two elements under the commercial courts act aspects which can said to be only pertaining to a defect which you can cure in a refiling but the larger number of judgments have said that defects under the commercial courts act are largely to be read as being fundamental in nature and therefore they may actually amount to the concerned pleading itself becoming honest therefore completely obliterating the entire value of that pleading as far as your defense or your articulation of the case is concerned now with this particular aspect in mind uh, one also needs to take a look at how inspection is to proceed now uh, when we come to admission denial or when we come to wanting more documents from an other another party there is now a strict timeline of 30 days now within this 30 days you are required to inspect all of these relevant documents and issue notices to the other side of production of documents which you require inspection of in addition to what has already been disclosed in the pleadings now for this also there are specific timelines which have been put in place and these are very very short timelines so as to ensure that you know this process which otherwise might take days and months or maybe even years is completed within a very very short timeline uh, of the uh, particular range of uh, time which is otherwise available to the court to dispose of a matter now this requirement for uh, specificity in the pleadings also translates to the admission denial see today admission denial also is something which is mostly done in a slightly stereotypical fashion so you will have admit deny there are variations there are admission denials which say you know receipt admitted contents denied receipt admitted contentious contents denied that's the best one because you know there doesn't require much application of mind you can argue it later what is a contentious contents so these are the practices which have developed not of course strictly flowing from the cpc now but under the commercial courts act once again all of these practices are mixed in the mud you have to file an admission denial within 15 days of the completion of the inspection uh, and in this admission denial it is admission and denial of documents document yes 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 absolutely so i must clarify this admission denial is the formal admission denial process of documents under the cpc which we of course do through the mode and mechanism of affidavits now uh, this is something the statement of admission and denial is to be set out explicitly in the sense that what exactly are you admitting or denying so are you denying correctness of content or are you denying existence itself are you denying execution are you denying issuance custody etc now when you do these specific parameters you are also required to give reasons so just like in the case of pleading you can't simply any more say i deny if you deny you must say so why so if there is a document if you deny it you must say i deny it because this document is forged i have never seen it before or you may deny a document to say i don't know about this document about the execution of this document this document belongs to the plaintiff i have never seen it so i have no knowledge or you may simply say yes i agree that this document exists but the contents of this document i have a serious contestation with so now the admission denial also much like in the case of an index much like in the case of a plain or a written statement is required to be very very specific bare unsupported denials are of no value now uh, of course uh, again you will have the same sort of uh, terminology which is required in an affidavit in case of an admission denial also in the sense of you know the correctness of the contents etc and uh, there are also consequences so if a court comes to a conclusion that there has been a frivolous denial of a document or an unethical denial of a document unfair denial of a document then the court may also is also empowered to pass uh, orders including uh, uh, imp uh, imposition of significant costs on uh, the party concerned now uh, the court also has the power at this stage now to waive proof for admitted documents or reject any documents at this stage which is also important because in a lot of trials you will see uh, mechanically even admitted documents are sought to be proved by witnesses because you know unfortunately in a lot in that there are a lot of judgments on this also including of justice patima 
uh, Singh of the Delhi High Court recently, where she said that you know it's now become very clear that in a lot of the evidence affidavits, it is a clear copy paste of the plaint or the written statement. And in fact, uh, Justice Endlaw, uh, <laughs> Justice Endlaw talks a lot on these you know procedural issues. So I remember Justice Endlaw uh, mentioned in one of the webinars that in fact in one of the affidavits, even the prayer clause was reproduced. <laughs> So the prayer clause in the plain was reproduced in the affidavit of evidence filed by a witness. Cause of action is reproduced. Right, 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 sir. So therefore, these are some of the difficulties that you know, which the Commercial Courts Act, in terms of practice or procedure or principle, seems to, uh, to a certain extent, obviate or chop down on. Now, uh, when it comes to production of documents, also. There is a far more uh, stringent mechanism which has been put in place. The uh, court is required or the court is empowered to order at any time during the pendency of a suit, a production of a document in the possession of either party. And uh, it is required to be responded to within a period of, let's say, one day to at the maximum 15 days. And if there is no plausible reason given for an inability to produce, then obviously the court has the power to uh, draw an in, uh, adverse inference against the uh, party concerned. So now there is an explicit power which is vested now with the court to seek production of a relevant document at any time during the pendency of a suit. So unlike earlier where there was a general notion that, you know, okay, now we have crossed that stage, we are into evidence, we are into oral submissions. You cannot now seek a, a document from me. It's not something which you can even remotely seek to argue. So, of course, there is always an element of inherent power of the court. But now the Commercial Courts Act completely uh, makes it very clear that such a power is specifically possessed by a commercial court under the Commercial Courts Act. Now, in the case of electronic records also, usually when we talk about electronic records, we always talk about 65B, the 65B affidavit or you know, the requirements under 65B. But the Commercial Courts Act brings into application independent requirements in terms of what you are required to plead whenever you are filing an electronic record as a form, as a part of a document. Now, as you see in uh, uh, in the Commercial Courts Act, you may even, you have the discretion to produce this in electronic form or in addition to or in lieu of printouts. But you are also required to uh, give a lot of details in relation to this electronic record, which to a certain extent is paramateria with the requirements under 65B and which is reproduced in uh, part three of the slide. So therefore, you know, the parties, the manner in which the record was produced, the dates and time, et cetera, et cetera. The source, uh, in case of email IDs, details of ownership, in case of documents, again, ownership, custody, deponent's knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So now the Commercial Courts Act has an independent format for proving or I would not use the word for, for proving, for placing on record electronic evidence. And therefore, these specific criteria are required to be adhered to or met by any party that seeks to rely on electronic evidence in a trial under the Commercial Courts Act. Now, again, this is important because a lot of people, a lot of us, we are very you know, comfortable with just filing an email or you know just filing, say, a video recording without really considering the explicit requirements under 65B. Now, under 65B, there are judgments which now say that, you know, a 65B can always be filed at a later stage. It need not be filed immediately. But in the case of the Commercial Courts Act, once again, you will have to contend with the fact that the document when filed at that stage itself, all of these details are necessary to be given to the Commercial Court. So unlike in the case of 65B, where there was some leeway, and you could file it subsequently in time when a dispute arose. Now you need to be very, very particular when you file electronic evidence on the very first date. Now, uh, yes, now the result of all of this ultimately, now you may have hundreds of requirements, but if it does not really aid to the efficacy of the dispute resolution process, at best it can be said to be window dressing. But why is what we've discussed across this period important? It's important because now the Commercial Courts Act specifically empowers a commercial court to pass summary judgment in cases where it finds 
that the plaintiff has no real prospect of succeeding defendant has no real prospect of defending or for you know in the absence of any other compelling reason for recording of oral evidence now even under the erstwhile cpc or the unamended cpc there was a provision for a court to pass a summary judgment if it found that no issue was required to be framed but the case law revolving around that had given it very limited application now the commercial courts act explicitly fleshes out the fact that a court may very well come to a conclusion that the lack of prospect of succeeding in a claim is now an explicit ground to reject it similarly the lack of a real prospect on the part of a defendant to defend the claim is also a specific ground to now allow the suit at the very initial stage by utilizing the summary judgment provision now at any point in time before issues are framed you are entitled or the court is entitled to invoke this power now why is this important in the context of what we have discussed so far so now in the judgment in tulio duc spa versus house of trims private limited the delhi high court in the context of a written statement held that if your written statement does not really bring out specific contestation as required under the commercial courts act there is absolutely no obligation on the court to frame issue so earlier you know it is as a matter of right we would say no no i have denied this sir i have not admitted this sir therefore you must necessarily set the matter down for trial but now you no longer can say that because if you do not meet a high benchmark of what constitutes disputation or contestation under the commercial courts act the court is not required to frame issues merely because you've put in evidence saying i deny this i deny that i don't admit this this is a matter of record so therefore this is where the entire element of framing a proper pleading whether in the context of a plaint or in the context of a written statement really comes to the fore whether a trial is required at all can be decided right right absolutely absolutely i mean i i that, that's exactly the best way of summarizing this that now that discretion is expressly vested with the court the fundamental decision whether to go for trial or not is now vested completely with the court so you know if you assist in that discretion being employed against you by <laughs> not taking into consideration the requirements of the commercial courts act then as noted in tulio gc the court's not going to come to the aid of a litigant who's not bothered to even meet the benchmark which the commercial courts act has postulated now uh, now uh, see obviously now ultimately uh, if the original uh, suit itself was filed as a summary suit then there is no question of a summary judgment because a summary suit by itself already encapsulate or you know takes into account the features of a, a summary adjudication now uh, obviously an application which you file for summary judgment is also something which must be done in a particular manner this of course is more let's say you know in the format that permits a court to at the outset or ex face i identify why it is that you know the summary judgment power must be exercised so this is more in the nature of pinpointing for the learned judge pinpointing for the court as to what exactly you are pleading within the narrow confines of the summary judgment proposition so because this is an irrelevant why because once you have a provision for summary judgment it is natural that every plaintiff will try before the issue is framed and every defendant will also try before the issue is framed to try and get a summary judgment either way so to to obviate or to remove the possibility of frivolous application being filed this sort of you know specialized format has been envisaged under the commercial courts act so that you know frivolous applications can be rejected at the very outset because if there is a lot of factual contestation etc it will be very clear from your application and that will make it very clear that you know this is not a matter which will uh, something which you know uh, which deserves a summary judgment now uh, of course the applicant may rely on documentary evidence in support of its application and uh, uh, what is important is therefore you know this to a certain extent goes beyond say an order 7 rule 11 or something of that sort because in an order 7 rule 11 as we all know there is that that limitation that you know only the averments in the plaint can be looked at nothing else 
some judgments have gone to the extent of saying a replication might you might be able to look at a replication also but otherwise a defendant was severely disabled in the sense that trial had to happen unless you know uh, he could show or he or she could show that very very high benchmark that the paint the paint itself on a pure reading of it accepting what is said there to be correct does not lead to any cause of action but in a summary judgment provision the the range of documentation which can be relied upon is far wider and therefore it gives you more of a leeway and more of an opportunity to be able to either have a case knocked off or a case decided in your favor in a summary fashion by reference to the uh, relevant documentation now again the reply to such an application also must be precise it must be in a particular format and can't be you know all over the place again that's a repetition of what we again looked at in in, in a lot of the earlier provisions now again if you intend to rely on any document uh, in your uh, in your argument you must rely upon it you must file it with your reply and uh, you must also specify what further evidence you might possibly be able to bring on record during the matter of a trial so this is crucial there might be that's the whole point of oral uh, for, of oral evidence and there might be elements of evidence or facts which cannot be brought about in the case of a documentary evidence alone therefore if you are able to show to the court tell the court that these a b c are the elements of evidence which i can only bring before you at the stage of oral evidence therefore do not non suit me at the stage that is definitely something which the court will consider while adjudicating on the application so as to ensure that there is no prejudice caused to a party by short circuiting the procedure and not going to trial at all so uh, therefore these are all elements which you now need to specifically plead this is not something you can pull out of your hat at the stage of oral arguments anymore at least textually as far as the commercial courts act is concerned now another very important uh, factor which has been brought in by the commercial courts act is a case management theory now this is something very very novel to our uh, let's say civil trial process because always our understanding of civil trial used to be that the entire adjudication of a case is based on the uh, orders passed on the judicial side with regard to the mandate to be followed by the parties so you will have an order passed by a learned judge saying all right file admission denial within one week list the matter there up so we are used to a more ad hoc system of case management here where each order each order of a day takes care of one element of the proceedings now in the case of say arbitration hearings many a times you will have in the very first hearing a entire schedule which is drawn out by an arbitral tribunal now of course uh, on the lighter side that uh, schedule is followed more in breach than in actual compliance at least in the case of arbitration proceedings but that model has now been incorporated into the commercial court so therefore now the court is required to actually take or uh, bring about a case management hearing now this case management hearing for the first time is to be held within 4 weeks from the date of filing of the admission uh, affidavit of admission denial of documents by all parties and there is a timeline under the act that arguments have to be closed within 6 months of the first case management hearing now the 6 yes. month period again like i said in the absence of the requisite number of manpower i highly doubt how this can be adhered to in the present situation but the case management hearing itself is very very important because in the case management hearing as an advocate as a practitioner you have to be very very specific with the court as to how exactly the future proceedings are to go on so on that date you must be clear how many days will the witnesses be cross examined what are the other processes that you might require and what are the days on which you will have effective oral arguments in the matter now again this is something which is very much in the infancy and a case management hearing is inherently subject to the future board of the court the future roster of the court for instance as i mentioned even the most well meaning person a judge who has 60 matters on his board in a day how effectively can that gentleman actually be able to you know put into effect something like this 
you know it is humanly impossible so again like i said subject to problems of hardware in terms of the provisions this case management hearing has been given a very exalted position and it is not something to be taken lightly much like a hearing on the merits this is also a hearing which is taken very seriously under the commercial courts act and there are consequences provided for non adherence to this particular provision at any relevant point of time now uh, i mean i think we are coming to the end of the uh, discussion now even when it comes to uh, written arguments there is now a specific procedure provided for under the commercial court side now see when it comes to a plaint when it comes to a written statement there is or an admission denial there is at least a basic semblance of formality but written submissions in that sense are usually treated as you know an orphan child because uh, the kind of uh, you know by written submissions which one sees sometimes it is something which is you know which does not have much of a trapping of formality so uh, ultimately under the cpc there are many judgments also of the courts which say that you know a written submission is a very valuable tool for a judge to be able to appreciate the controversy in the entirety at the stage where the trial has ended and judgment has been reserved so now the commercial courts act to ensure that there is a standardized format and to ensure that certain basic desired datum is mentioned is uh, always present in a written statement under the commercial courts act lays down the following requirements so in terms of the fact that you must indicate provisions of law you must indicate citations you must necessarily give a copy of your written submission to the other side because that also something which doesn't happen very often unlike in the case of a pleading and of course there is also a provision for the court to file to require the parties to file revised written arguments if it so deems fit so now much like in the case of a pleading a written state a written submission is also specifically engrafted into the overall process of trial under the commercial court act and which of course is something which is very important on both sides for a learned judge to be able to appreciate the controversy holistically as also for a party or an advocate to be able to put in writing everything that was argued in oral submission because otherwise you know there is a lot of controversy sometimes i argued this before the learned judge but this issue was not dealt with by the court so a a comprehensive written submission also takes care to a large extent of the controversies which may arise on that front now uh, again there are certain other uh, amendments which are made to the uh, specific rules of the cpc i am not spending too much time on this but uh, one must realize that the affidavits of uh, evidence are to be filed simultaneously this of course is a rule of practice but in some cases you know one would see ad hoc filings now the commercial courts act makes it very clear that is not permissible and uh, the additional evidence is also something now which cannot be brought on record at the mere asking or in a very cavalier fashion it must be specifically permitted only on sufficient cause with you know being demonstrated now one interesting innovation in the commercial courts act is the specific power given to a party to withdraw the affidavit of a witness prior to commencement of the cross examination now this is important because at the time of filing of the witness statements naturally a party might be anxious in terms of what it can possibly prove through its earlier witnesses so there are cases where you may have six seven witnesses so in fact it is only the first two or three who actually postulate your case but you know you are always anxious what if they are not able to you know really put the case forth so as a backup you have certain other witnesses now always there used to be this stigma that if you withdrew any witness it would be you know a, a halabu and the lawyer would say oh this witness is withdrawn that means you know you have not proved this not proved that so there was always a stigma attached to withdrawing a witness which the commercial courts act to a large extent takes care of it is also conducive for early conclusion of trial because in the course of cross examination of a particular witness of the other side you manage to get something out of that witness which in fact suffices for your purposes and you don't therefore have to lead one particular witness whose affidavit you already filed so at that stage you may decide to withdraw that affidavit again without any adverse inference being drawn 
so therefore also in the interest of early conclusion of a trial the order is amended to specifically permit you to withdraw without any adverse inference being drawn which again all also helps in a lot of wasteful you know uh, uh, evidence being let without any purpose whatsoever now uh, th this again is a provision which again ties in the last end which is that once judgment is reserved then within 90 days of conclusion of arguments judgment is required to be pronounced now see this is obviously a very salutary provision even the supreme court has given guidelines saying you know judgment should not be reserved beyond 6 months etc but again as i said ultimately the software is excellent but to expect a judge in our country who has 50 55 60 matters on board in a day to be able to strictly adhere to this is again like i said it's something which all of us have to introspect as stakeholders and again obviously i think for that very reason you know there is no real consequence in that strict sense of uh, this particular timeline being uh, breached in that sense so uh, i mean this is essentially what all i had to say in terms of the commercial courts act one element which i think i missed in the slide as i mentioned that under the plaint and the written statement you are required to file all your documents which are relevant the regime under the commercial courts act for filing additional documents is very very strict so earlier you know if if supposing a cross evidence affidavits had not been filed issues had not been framed courts were very liberal in allowing additional documents to be filed but in a catena of judgments by various high courts additional documents are now being routinely rejected because the party is not able to establish that very high benchmark in the sense of being able to demonstrate that these documents were either completely unavailable or not relevant to the plaint or the written statement as and when filed so please note that the benchmark for filing additional documents also has been significantly increased under the commercial courts act and you cannot now slip in an additional document at a later stage at the mere asking so uh, effectively you know in terms of the radical changes which the act brings about in terms of our civil trial process and uh, why it effectively represents a significant cultural shift because if you see the law commission recommendation aside from efficacy speed global rankings the law commission report said that we are aiming for a complete cultural change in the way in which litigation is conducted in the country now you know cultural change you know is something which usually takes time but the commercial courts act is something which in its infancy at least you know normatively propounds significant differentials in terms of how our civil trial process is going to go forward into the future now just to uh, end uh, here one last comment which i would make is i think one of the issues which as justice venkatesh pointed out when the act was first brought into place it intended to only cater to very high value disputes now there was naturally a legitimate criticism of this in the sense that you were giving priority to matters which involved far larger commercial stakes whereas you know the litigant with a lower commercial stake was subjected to say a slower process but the problem which has now come in the act once that limit has been stretched to 3 lakhs is it's sort of like the dog in the manger sort of analogy because now the problem is the definition under the commercial courts act in terms of subject matter is already very wide <laughs> added to the expanded definition under the commercial courts act you now also have a very low threshold in terms of the pecuniary jurisdiction which is 3 lakhs so now this has created a problem because as i mentioned the hyderabad example in terms of the original formulation that learned judge might have had 10 matters on his or her board but now because of this expansion you now have a huge number of matters which are now going to the commercial courts so in terms of jurisdiction the commercial court now is increasingly taking over you know the the uh, sort of en masse taking over the erstwhile jurisdiction of the civil court now this is not a bad thing but the problem is the hardware again 
because now effectively you have two parallel processes continuing and the efficacy and speed of the commercial code sack is now being significantly blunted by this huge onrush of cases into the system for which you know there is not sufficient manpower and to a certain extent i think this is very reminiscent of what happened to section 138 of the negotiable instruments act so it was a very laudatory provision but it got inundated by the sheer number and now you know effectively we are even talking about a decriminalization because you know the system is damp act it completely destroyed the criminal system because of the number of cases which are now piling up so i think these are some of the you know issues which are still open for debate you know and um, issues of controversy which will range for uh, many many days to come into the future but as justice venkatesh said you know the act itself is in the infancy as a practitioner i am i am, I am in the infancy in terms of what this act represents but uh, as of today you know these are i believe in my uh, opinion from a practitioner's point of view the fundamental issues which have uh, arisen in terms of the commercial courts act in terms of mandatory processes and timelines so uh, thank you so much everybody uh, that's it from me thank you dr amit george it was a wonderful exposition uh, i wonder whether this would be a harbinger of uh, good times to come where uh, we have a uh, a uh, speedy justice in the sense like uh, the the delay in the pleading stage could be cut down and also we can still hope for a judgment in within a reasonable time with all this lordship sitting here but still uh, i think this can also be viewed in a manner wherein law as an instrument or as a means of social change right because our outlook the way which we have been attuned to a system wherein everything uh, pleading uh, the laxity in the pleading and everything could be corrected later on and uh, we have up to number of ias could be filed interlocutory applications so amendment anything and everything could be done so right. all those things we are just shaken from our what you call uh, slumber and asked to act properly so that i think uh, speedy disposal means more cases more cases and uh, more belief and faith in the system i think uh, that's a very positive move uh let us hear the comments from uh, justice venkatesh himself yeah so as i told you look at the advantage one has when expressing oneself one is when one he is one is involved in the process of implementing this commercial code act so that's the wonderful thing which came out of the speaker today see it's, it's very important to understand one thing uh, we are steeply caught in a culture where persons or districts which are sort of financially well to do or who can afford a litigation in one suit the one suit can result in 25 crps to 50 crps into the high court every time there is an interlocutory application filed it comes up to the high court goes back to the subordinate court comes up to the high court goes up to the so persons who can afford to do it will come to the high court by way of a crp if a place where persons cannot afford to do it it converts itself into criminal cases you will typically find that the most of the criminal cases which happens in a particular place in a particular district will relate or will have a civil dispute as the cause of such a uh, such a uh, 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 as a cause of action for converting itself into a criminal case it, this is across the board this is not something peculiar in tamil nadu for instance when it comes to kanyakumari you will find that one suit in kanyakumari we can convert itself in 25 to 30 crps the the places which is near to it like thootukudi criminal vedi it would have converted itself into a criminal case because of the persons taking things to their own hands so this is i think this is something which peculiar which, which happens across the country so we are now steeped into a system like that for instance a civil litigation in this country is thought to be a weapon to harass the other side it is being used to harass the other side it is being used to drag a person to court for generations together not one or two but generations together can be dragged into a court and sometimes when i walk across the corridors i would find some dogs moving on in the side so i used to jokingly tell my brother judges that this dog at one birth was actually a litigant which had filed some appeal before this court but by the time we took up that appeal he died and but he does not want to leave the court 
so he is in a different form trying to see if at least now the court is disposing of this appeal or not because there was no re there is no reason why dog has to come inside the court and keep loitering in the corridors when its place is elsewhere so that's the type of system into which we have steeped today now this commercial courts act has virtually jolted it has virtually waken up everybody by just tweaking certain things in cpc only there is nothing special which has come out of it it has just tweaked some three sections and some orders in cpc and the result of it is it actually gives a responsibility right from the filing of the case till the delivery of the judgment every stage there is a time limit prescribed every stage there is a responsibility that is expected of the counsel for plaintiff for plaintiff counsel for defendant and also the court why i am saying this i am saying this because if you see section 17 of this act 17 of the act mandates that every commercial court will have to publish in the website the number of cases it has disposed of so so therefore you cannot escape now now it is mandatory under section 17 that the court has to publish in its website how many cases got in how many cases you disposed of so the responsibility has now been given across the board right from filing up to the delivery of judgment as the speaker rightly said it is important that we have sufficient judges to do it see look at look at it practically see these are very effective provisions where a lot of a lot of stringency is brought in and frivolity is sought to be taken out from the whole mindset about civil litigations but what is important what is important is that a judge sitting in this jurisdiction must be exclusively made to sit at least for a year or else it will become almost impossible everything will be in the book the judge for instance he the uh, um, uh, the speaker was talking about the case management theory for instance a judge does a case management hearing he fixes time limits for everything then his portfolio changes a new judge comes in how is he expected to take it over from there and to do it see it's not practically possible we may be talking about all these things but what is important is that it's very important that we have the infrastructure which can keep doing this see for instance now it has been reduced to 3 lakhs as he rightly says till the advent of 138 criminal courts were actually doing criminal jurisdiction after 138 many magistrates have now forgotten how to conduct a criminal trial and many advocates think that by doing 138 cases they have become criminal side advocates they have absolutely no idea as to what is there in crpc at all and see what this 138 to 142 has done for this country it has virtually shaken the entire criminal justice system altogether and i think the maximum confusion has happened from 138 to 142 of the negotiation instruments act and in fact i think it was some curse which happened to the criminal justice system by the insertion of this one even today we are grappling with all these problems so therefore this reduction into 3 lakhs now brings in a very important factor what is that factor that factor is that you will have to identify which are all those districts where such commercial disputes are there and accordingly fix courts the number of courts which can accommodate this if you don't do it what happens is that a regular court which is dealing with regular civil cases will be put to pressure by this additional burden of this commercial court act which gives timelines for every stage of hearing so what happens the judge will start focusing on the commercial courts uh, the, the, the commercial disputes and then the other cases goes for a six like how concentrating on 138 all the other cases went for a six 324 nothing was happening in the criminal court in the magistrate court so therefore the, the, the courts were grappling they don't they, they didn't know where to keep the bundle with them that's the stage to which it went so therefore if this enactment is has to be successful it's important that the infrastructure and the number of judges who deal with it must be made sufficient to 
must be given a continuous period of at least a year to deal with it that's the only way where you can make it perfect if you don't do it if you keep changing the portfolio once in 3 months then what happens is that nobody is thorough about this procedure we can keep talking about this enactment for our life but nothing will come out of it it will be another failure on our part so therefore what becomes important is to as he rightly said is to increase the number of judges is to identify the places where the courts will have to be established to deal with commercial disputes so the, that exercise becomes very very important in view of the 2018 amendment so therefore kerala the, the, the fact that i am addressing this to the kerala audience mainly is because now this is get into kerala also because even though you don't have original jurisdiction here in your kerala high court but this is going to get into the into kerala also because of the amendment that has taken place in 2018 where it has brought down the pecuniary jurisdiction to uh, to, to to 3 lakhs and it is contemplating the the uh, the establishment of commercial courts at a district level and below district level also so obviously it has to get into kerala also and every state is going to now take it up that is why in the beginning i said that if we are able to properly run through this enactment and make it successful it is going to one create a complete cultural change in the way in which we are dealing with civil cases today it is going to bring in a new culture where it will be possible for the legislature in future to bring in such time limits to bring in such stringency even in a regular civil litigation between parties so therefore it is all our collective responsibilities to ensure that this act is properly implemented and the last thing about which i wanted to address is the appeal uh, about which the speaker was saying see basically if you look at the the uh, hierarchy of courts one is after the amendment one is a commercial court below the district judge level section 13 of the act here as against the order of that court an appeal lies before commercial appellate court the commercial appellate court is in the category of a district judge and it is defined under section 3 capital a so district judge will be the appellate authority in so far as a judgment or an order rendered by a commercial court below the level of a district judge one what are the other courts there is can be a commercial court at the district judge level at the district judge level so as against the judgment or order of the commercial court at the district judge level and the commercial division in the high court which has the original jurisdiction the appeal goes before the commercial appellate division of the high court consisting of a division bench it goes before a division bench so therefore in both these cases the appeal actually goes before the commercial appellate division of the high court and in the other case where where the commercial court is below the level of a district judge the appeal goes before the commercial appellate court which is the district court you have to keep this in mind when it comes to appeal that is provided and as he said there is only one appeal that is provided there is no other appeal but look at how loosely it is worded and confused if you look at section 13 of the act it will start saying the heading of the provision will say appeals from underline this word decrees of commercial courts and commercial divisions this is how it starts this is what the heading says but look at what is stated inside any person aggrieved by the judgment or order is what is stated in the book so therefore it is again loosely worded the word judgment has been very loosely uh, worded in section 13 and as correctly held by the division bench of the delhi high court in hpl limited case if you want the citation it is 2017 uh, volume 238 delhi law times page 123 page 123 is a division bench judgment where the delhi high court dealt with this issue and said that this expression judgment that is used there is actually 
denoting only a decree it relates only to a decree and not a judgment as you all know judgment decree order everything is independently defined under the the code of civil procedure under section 29 section 22 and section 24 of the act so therefore we have to specifically and look at how loosely they do it as a result of this what happened what happened was initially as the speaker was saying the bombay high court in shababul uh, took note of shababul kimji and instead of reading it as or please look at the word it, it is it has to be read as judgment or order the bombay high court read it as and judgment and order and it started employing the test given by shababul kimji and there was a huge confusion as he said shambhavla uh, this this uh, this shambhavla kimji case caused lot of confusion even otherwise but this judgment was laid upon by the bombay high court if i am right in uh, uptown limited case am i right uh, uh, uptown limited case and it came to the conclusion and it read it as judgment and order right yes that that was a big mistake that was uh, committed but now fortunately there is a Uh, amendment to do it so therefore when you read it you have to read it as a decree or order there are two separate facets to it decree as defined under section 22 the speakers here all know what is the significance of a decree a judgment can be a common judgment in four suits one judgment but it can result in four decrees and each decree is an independent decree which has to be appealed by the party who is aggrieved by the decree and the party cannot be allowed to say that i will i will one person has already challenged the common judgment therefore it is not necessary for me to challenge the decree that goes the judicata gets in the, the law is settled in that so if the title says uses the word decree according to me the body should have used the very same word decree it should not have said judgment it is a decree because it's possible that there is a there is a suit and there is a counter claim so it can be a common judgment in the suit and the counter claim but what comes out of it there is one common judgment but two decrees the suit may be dismissed counter claim may be allowed the suit may be allowed counter claim may be dismissed it will result in two decrees actually so therefore the legislature should have been more careful while drafting this the other big confusion comes when it talks about order 43 of cpc see if the second provision the, the proviso to the section 13 says provided that an appeal shall lie from such orders such orders by a commercial division or a commercial court that are specifically enumerated under order 43 of cpc it just left it there now the question is the question is order 43 has different state and amendments in order 43 madras high court would have added something bombay would have added something kerala would have added something does it mean to say that it includes those amendments also it merely takes this order 43 and imports it into section 13 and this how do we understand when we understand an order we have to understand it by reading it along with section 104 of cpc it is 104 and order 43 of cpc is how we have to understand when it comes to this term order as used under section 13 of the act see and so therefore if according to me when you read that it has to take within its fold even the state amendments which had taken place in the particular state within whose jurisdiction this order 43 has been amended added etc etc so therefore that becomes very important the next important uh, the, uh, uh, problem which according to me we may be facing is that uh, i said that there is only one appeal there is only one appeal you can you can do nothing about it there is no revision etc so if in a case for instance the appellate court remands the matter to the commercial division to the commercial court now as against a remand there is an appeal which is provided under order 43 now what happens so what do you do the act says 
the the proviso says that an appeal shall lie from such orders passed by a commercial division so on so that are specifically enumerated under order 43 that's what the proviso is saying then the subsection 2 to section 13 says not to be standing anything contained in any other law for the time being in force or letter patents of the high court no appeal shall lie from any order or decree here the word decree is used or decree uh, of a commercial division or a commercial court otherwise than in accordance with the provisions of this act so therefore it says the appeal as provided it will so not with standing is a non obstante clause which is provided under section 132 what happens in a case where the appellate court at the district level remands the matter back what happens in a case where the the appellate court at the uh, at the uh, district level uh, refuses to readmit uh, an appeal if it refuses to readmit an appeal which is uh, uh, possible under the code of uh, uh, civil procedure under uh, order 41 rule 19 and 21 14 what happens if such an order is passed for order 43 provides for an appeal here but the proviso says that only an appeal will... the, these are certain issues that may crop up in so far as the appeal is concerned this the problem has cropped up only because of the 2018 amendment which has now brought in the vesting of jurisdiction on a court below the district judge and giving the the power of appeal to a district court so therefore now our advocates will become more intelligent and will say okay there may not be any appeal but we will use article 227 so therefore Uh, it's always possible for us to come up with our own innovations that's how the <laughs> so that's how it will happen but when the legislature does all these things it's important that a lot of uh, 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 concentration is made on these things because many times i've seen that any amendment that comes through this knee jerk reactions see this knee jerk reaction came because all of a sudden they realized that world bank ranking is based on the performance of the disposal of the commercial dispute at a district court level whereas nothing was happening at the district court level since the jurisdiction was not given to that it was given to the commercial division in the high court then they realized no no something then somebody said that this is a five star treatment that is being given to the people who have lot of uh, money and you are not therefore what they did they reduced it to 3 lakhs see these are all knee jerk reactions which can result in real problems so and if such amendments are made what happens is that more than giving you a solution it will create more problems like what happened when they added proviso to section 372 of crpc it is chaotic that 372 proviso now nobody understands whether a complainant and a victim is the same whether 372 proviso will apply even to x6 private complaint all sorts of interpretations are coming and we are grappling it at a very very big way in our high court in madras high court uh, so what is important is that when such amendments are brought in it's better that they are discussed and brought in rather than having a knee jerk reaction same thing happened in that uh, uh, in the juvenile justice act also after the nirbhaya judgment where a child is treated to be an adult when a heinous offence is committed for which there is an enquiry contemplated and all that now the supreme court found that what happens to the cases where the punishment is only up to 7 years the provision is not uh, uh, is not really covering it therefore the supreme court gave an interpretation saying treat it as a serious offence not as a heinous offence so these things will have to be kept in mind more particularly when it comes to enactments of this nature because i don't see it as a enactment i see it as attempt to change the whole cultural setup or the very uh, with a very uh, the uh, what do i say it 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 seeks to basically change our mindset on civil litigations completely so therefore when that is done it's very important that a lot of things are taken into consideration when amendments are brought in thank you thank you sir uh, over to you ravishan sir uh, in fact i am a, i can say that a new student to this uh, present law because at the time when i was practicing 
this act has not come because by 2015 i became a district judge i had no occasion to deal with the commercial court provisions even at that time because at that time it was with the high court thereafter when i became a high court judge also the old act gone and new act come by the time i retired <laughs> so there is no occasion for me to go into those aspects but uh, as i heard from uh, justice venkat brother venkatesh and also uh, dr amit that it cannot be said that old cpc does not because as a conventional civil lawyer i don't say that there is no safeguards provided under the old 1908 cpc or by the amended cpc 2002 because there are guidelines provided how the uh, judgment will be provided uh, passed discovery and uh, the issues were there but all confusions arise as only because as justice uh, anand may be knowing because of the judge, judge made loss judge made loss gives lot of interpretation for each provision gives new new room for how this will, the, the restrictions provided in the rules or the act can be overcome for the purpose of elongating the procedure for conducting the trials and another thing as rightly pointed out by amit see when you are establishing new uh, enacting new acts and providing specialization on certain courts you will have to find out the feasibility of a particular number of courts which is required also as we anticipated and uh, unless you provide number of courts as the in the judges judges case judges association case as the supreme court has said in uh, pro rata with the population it is very difficult to uh, uh, follow the timeline that has been provided so i think that um, generally speaking it is a old wine in a new bottle with a new setup provided and everything depends upon the mindset attitude of lawyers and the judges who are trying the cases as to how this, how far this can be implemented in the manner in which it was legislature intended to uh, bring about to bring the commercial activities to the uh, what you call the indeg- with an integrity i can say with an integrity and there is a provision for mediation i don't because i think that when the legal service authority act was amended when the mediation conciliation proceedings were also there there was i remember correct there is a provision for before coming to the court you will have to go for pre settlement and then only you can come back but as a governing body member of the mediation i do not know how far the judges are having the mindset of appreciating the process of alternate dispute resolution i do not know 89 cpc Uh, 89 cpc 89 cpc 89 cpc conciliation and sending it for mediation and also understanding the afghan case yes. of compulsory sending it to mediation before the trial is an or or 10a or 10a is introduced for that purpose how yes. many judges are doing it i do not know that's right that's right so in, 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 mindset of mindset of mind when you, when you are sitting in the commercial court the mindset of the judges also must change to adopt themselves into the alternate dispute resolution have faith in the alternate dispute resolution and then only after following that you will have to proceed to the trial so that the problem can cause the even otherwise if the, the, those provisions are provided only for an speedy trial where relationship will not be retained because of course if we go through the afghan case what are the nature of cases that can be referred for a mediation or for log adalat has been discussed so if you understood that in way even how many family courts are being settled here so unless the man the mindset of the lawyers mindset of the people to give value for the truth and integrity of what they are saying is changed i don't think that uh, this also will have the same effect of a uh, continuing with the uh, natural proceedings of a civil court only because they will say that i went for log adalat we tried for a settlement not settled so i came here so that is enough how far the uh, the serious effects have been done how far the uh, the procedure pro- contemplated for conducting a mediation or conducting an adalat has been gone into how far the settlement discussions have been made unless those things were gone into by the commercial court to come to a conclusion that there was a serious attempt made i can say underline the word serious attempt made for settlement before coming to the court so this is what the the now the, the kerala high court the kerala mediation uh, center is trying to Uh, how uh, media the uh, uh, mediation advocacy training the lawyers to understand the intricacies of a mediation and the importance of mediation in yes. cases where uh, the, the quick reliefs can be possible without going to the trial and also in the cpc also earlier there is a provision for you can pass 
uh, pre preliminary degrees on yes. the basis of admission. How many yes. courts are following it? Yes. Uh, no court. I think uh, in my uh, service as a lawyer or as a service as a judge, uh, no uh, decree has been passed on the basis of the admission and postponing the uh, decision making in respect of where serious disputes have been raised. True. So all those things have been now uh, coming in a new form. Let us see how far it is fruitful. If it is fruitful, it will be helpful for the public. Yes, yes. Let the business. Yes. I, I can only say I can only say the business community. As far as other cases are concerned, you will have to face the same stance. So I will have to say one thing. See, before, before the East India Company came into this uh, country, came into this country, there was a big difference between the way in which they treated sovereign issues and the way in which they treated commercial issues. The commercial issues never used to come in the way of the government dealing with the or the courts dealing with the sovereign issues. Uh, but there, you did not have a formal court. So therefore, I'm using the word government. So uh, a ruler, it's rather. There, the 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 uh, the business community itself had a mechanism of handling it. The whole confusion came after the advent of the East India Company, which also came to India only to do business, not to do some welfare to India. It came only to do business. By coming here, the laws which started coming here start, started clogging the courts with commercial disputes. Or else the commercial disputes as a history, if you read history, you will find that there are always ways and means for the commercial, for the business community itself to handle such uh, disputes without really getting to the, into the, uh, the ruler. Have you ever heard a ruler dealing with a commercial dispute between parties? It used to be always a sovereign function that used to be exercised. So that is why, if I remember in that LIC or the Scott case, uh, the first three pages would have been devoted only for this, where the court would have said that you are unnecessarily troubling courts with all your commercial disputes and that you are taking away the most important time of the Supreme Court. You are not allowing it to deal with important constitutional issues. So only as an alternative, all these things are being now attempted. But as you said, that it is important that we understand it, we appreciate it, and we are honest in implementing. It. And let us not have it just in the paper without there being an infrastructure to deal. I congratulate both brother Venkatesh and uh, Amit to throw light on the uh, new act to the uh, lawyer community as such, and also we are also enriched on on account of that. Thank hey, you very much, sir. Ramachand, sir. Today is special for us for it being the 72nd session, and more than that. Somebody who we were uh, after to be on the platform could attend this on his own birthday. It's something entirely different. We all take this opportunity to wish uh, Justice uh, Anand Venkatesh a very happy birthday. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think it does not come in our uh, WhatsApp group, it appears. Anand's birthday was omitted by the group, it appears. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we, have, we have good friends and we have good contacts wherein all these secrets just reaches us. <laughs> so, now moving on to the interactive session, we have a couple of persons who have put the hand up. I'll start with uh, Nitin. Nitin, please unmute yourself and put the question. Namaste, sir. Actually, my question was answered by Justice Anand only, but again, I would uh, emphasize on the question that pertains to appeal part. Uh, sir, my question was, uh, since the uh, district has been uh, conferred with the power of appellate court, now many a times it may commit a mistake. Then the remedy is lies only with Article 227 and the special leave petition because somewhere or the other I may have a feeling no I think the district judge has committed some error and they need to go before the uh, uh, Supreme Court that uh, fear I may have and my one or two more questions are there only sir if you would again tell us two Delhi items which you voice is breaking. There's a network problem. <clears throat> so suddenly, in the middle, the voice dropped off. Yeah, yeah. That's it, I mean, uh, are you there? Maybe you can go to the next one. Let yeah, him come I back. Think, uh, that's better. Uh, uh, Vijay, can you unmute yourself? Nayapati Vijay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> I have heard the lecture through and through. See, there is a general perception. I regard to 
more number of reports because they are concerned only with regard to the time limits which are being imposed there is a general perception in all the talks that we keep hearing there should be more number of courts more number of judges but uh, if what i see is if you establish more number of courts there is equal increase in the litigation it is not as though you are trying to match the present litigation you need to have a number of courts for the anticipated litigation supposing the state of i come from hyderabad we have uh, the state is now split into two we have a high court in vijayawada also now the litigation has increased at least by 50% what was supposedly around 40% 40000 repetitions now by creating it was supposedly a consolidated high court and we were supposed to have 40000 repetitions roughly now by dividing the state and creating two high courts we have actually increased the litigation to around 55 to 60000 repetitions now how is it that the more courts are going to solve this issue one two the percentage of litigant public approaching the court is very limited now if you provide a very quick and an alternative relief there are it will encourage more neutralistic people to come approach court and there will be consequential increase in litigation i don't find any answer for all this uh, for this complicated issue because more courts there is only increase in litigation good for us no doubt this is the first uh, doubt i had this is to uh, honorable justice uh, uh, anand mcgrath yeah. and uh, happy uh, birthday to you sir thank you thank you <laughs> uh, see the you must be first happy that people are even now reposing confidence on courts i was if many times i used to wonder as to how people even now are reposing confidence on courts they should have lost confidence on courts by now they should have taken law into their own hands by now but there is some system which is now prevailing in this country where even now people are believing that they will some day get the justice rendered from a court so therefore people coming to court is something which has to be encouraged and it's important that we should never fight feel shy to handle the influx or increase in the number of litigations that is number 1 number 2 is that as i told you in the beginning civil litigations in many cases is done not for getting any relief it is done only to cause embarrassment to the other side many of the civil litigations if you see look at i give you two three examples one a tenant who decides to create problems for his landlord without paying rent etc he will just come before a court and file a suit for injunction injunction restraining the defendant not to evict me from the premises unless otherwise by due process of law and if he is able to produce prima facie documents before the court to prove his capacity as a tenant for at least 6 months he can go ahead with this because court will be satisfied with this prima facie case he will grant an injunction he will just go on prolong it for 6 months 4 months 5 months the landlord will have to come before the court and say no 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 i will not evict him like this i will only follow the provisions of the rent control act and do it by the time he comes and responds it is 3 months to 6 months gone so litigations in this country particularly the civil litigations in this country are used more for the purpose of causing embarrassment to the other side because the act as it existed as it is existing today is not having sufficient teeth to deal with people like that number 2 is many cases suits are filed only to get interlocutory orders this is more particularly in the high courts if you see in the high courts people will be arguing interlocutory applications like a final suit they a lot of senior advocates a battery of senior advocates will come a lot of time will be taken and there will be a lot of pressure put on the court for what for handling interlocutory applications but thereafter if you see which it come to a grinding halt there will be no progress in the completion of the pleadings there will be no progress in the issues there will be no progress in the trial everything will be standing as it is so in this case a suit was instituted not for getting a relief the suit was instituted for getting some urgent interim orders and they are satisfied 
and it is gone nobody has there after any interest in conducting this is in many cases involving intellectual property rights this happens so this is the attitude if with this attitude if you bring in an enactment like this the what is the expectation the expectation is that if there is a culture developed where there is a time limit fixed for completion of cases and where the courts are vested with real discretionary powers to impose heavy cost on the litigants who are coming and wasting the time of court probably it may be become a sort of uh, yeah, fa a factor which can curtail such frivolous litigations for instance in this enactment you will find in section 35 which has been substituted where a party who succeeds in the litigation can also be imposed with cost if it is found that some of the claims which he has uh, which he has made are frivolous claims to that extent discretion is given to the courts to deal with even a party who who substantially succeeds before the court so therefore it's important that all these uh, things which have developed for decades together will have to be broken if it has to be broken probably it may not happen in our lifetime but enactments like this if it is developed and it is made effective and it is properly operated it will pave a huge uh, uh, help to the to, uh, to the courts in handling civil litigations and the having more number of courts having more number of judges to deal with it according to me is a fundamental right of a litigant every litigant is is entitled to have his dispute resolved before a court so therefore there is no use in you are right in one thing without a quality judge howsoever quantity you raise there is no there is no use at all like what they used to say in the evidence act what is important is the quality of evidence and not the quantity of evidence same will apply to judges also you may be having 10 judges but if all the 10 judges are dimwits what do you do so therefore it all depends on who is sitting there as a judge what is his quality and if you have such persons obviously you must have more number of judges and more number of courts because we have a very very multifaceted country here and there is no one solution for anything india has peculiarities in everything and even in this litigation uh, uh, resolution so i think this enactment actually throws a new light as justice ramakrishnan said uh it was available in cpc uh, we, we are not talking something new here it was all available in cpc but see, but when it comes to operation the appeals and the revisions that used to go against the interlocutory orders etc used to clog the whole litigation itself here everything has been curtailed by bringing in timelines by by curtailing the appeal etc so i think we have to develop this we will have to hand hold this infant litigation and take it to its logical end this is according to me one of the most important enactments that has come into this country and it is our responsibility to somehow work it out one, one more thing giri i want to add to your vijay you said the litigations are increasing if you take the statistics of number of litigation pro rata with our population only 3% of the uh, litigation is coming to court other things are settled otherwise see i was only wondering if 3% becomes 4% the entire system will collapse well, no no that no that depends because even the repetition you said that number of repetitions are increasing i may i may my own reservations the populist judge or advocate popular judge in the high court we will say i lawyer has filed it we will admit it when the other party comes we will vacate it but ultimately what happens is there is no question of it coming up and as a, for a short period as five years as i coach what i find is the inspiration and the fighting spirit of a litigant in the trial court is not available in the high court either either person appearing for the appellant or petitioner or respondent once they have, they have filed their response as justice vengadesh has said there after they are waiting for the list, uh, list to come for hearing so that that also there must be some procedure or some method by which you will have to uh, see that things are done in a faster way and also find out the grouping of cases because earlier grouping of cases were being done properly by the sections nowadays that is also not properly happening suppose one case is disposed of on a question of law 
if the section was very careful they can um, um, uh, take all the all the cases of similar nature where the same principle can be applied and disposed of uh, number of cases can be disposed of by a uh, common judgment that is not being done nowadays that uh, uh, the capacity to group of a similar nature of cases is also lacking in the administrative side of the uh, the high court also there the lawyers also did not say that there is a connected case which has already disposed of they won't say and possibly they may get a uh, conflicting decisions also there are people who go to the uh, larger bench get it resolved so many things are happening no see in the entire pendency issue there is an employment issue of advocates so there is a tendency of advocate to keep coming back with one litigation or the other that that's always there see as far as this act is concerned this is a central enactment imposing a condition on the state enactment you see sec post section 20 that says state should provide infrastructure state should do it i just have a doubt whether any budget special budget is being provided by the center to this and normally i think that the establishment of court some percentage of amount will be given for establishing new courts by the central fund and the rest will have to be shared by the state normally that is the where you are going for new construct new courts are being established for a particular a special type of cases some amount i think that some provision is made for providing some fund from the sender sharing of uh, some portion by the state that normally it follows i do not know probably that depends upon whether it is a new court or suppose you are establishing uh, uh, I, uh, what do you call i can say that the delegating power to existing judge itself one suppose there are five district judges i uh, district judges in a court on principal decision additional to confer the jurisdiction of one additional district judge being the appellate court then there is no question of new court arises because you have got a uh, all every, everything is there that is what normally happens you say that courts are established but things are happening in that way he is given with a regular work also sometimes <laughs> I, i think that mr anand will agree with me <laughs> <laughs> True. Thank you. Thank you. Right. No. So I think the only problem is that uh, this fund allocation or this uh, calibration of how many judges we need is not done on a dynamic basis. So once that act is actually put in place in 2015, you know, with a huge halabu, you do a lot of let's say you know infrastructural additions. But after that is when really things start to slow down. Stagnation happens. You know. tendency increases so uh, the original conceptualization i remember was that you know, there is going to be a periodic review and based on the increase in the cases correspondingly you will push more judges into onto the commercial roster but if that doesn't happen then you know unfortunately we will run into the same quicksand which a lot of the other uh, legislations had run into there is a trend time limits are a trend in the last 5 years of legislation sorry i am <laughs> taking lot more time uh, shamit <laughs> It's a trend. Specifically, we have one year arbitrations, time limits, uh, commercial court time limits. We have time limits which are being introduced for whose sake without there being infrastructure improvement. But it has not percolated into our mind. That's the problem. It's, it it remains in the book. It has to be drilled. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vijay. Uh, I think Nitin is back. Uh, Hello, Jam. Hello, Jam. Yeah, Ram Kumar sir. I will come back. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw you. That's why. I mean. Uh, It's I was down with fever. I was down with fever. Rejuvenated yourself, <laughs> sir. I just it must have been. It must have been an excellent uh, lecture. Excellent uh, presentation by Mr. Amit, Dr. Amit. I know. I can know that. See, I don't know whether it was anybody had uh, mentioned that when the legislature stepped in by tightening the jurisdiction under 115 of the High Court, the revisional jurisdiction, Supreme Court came to the rescue of the. Of the lawyers by saying that you can challenge the orders under two twenty seven, Article two twenty seven. Opened up two twenty seven. Exactly, Surya Dev Rai. Yes, yes, yes. This is what is happening when the legislature tightens the jurisdiction of the courts. The pressure on the other side. Open. On the other side. <laughs> anyway, I'm. I'm i'm not feeling well i am i am having term running fever so you take care take care uh, take during care. This, okay. um, because no, during this period you must be very careful right yes <laughs> even a fever will not be afraid of corona <laughs> <laughs> even a fever will not be afraid of may uh, not be the morning corona. marathon session he would be tired <laughs> actually um, my it was my, my not more than that certain uh, promises were not kept by that 
platform. Okay, sir. Okay. That is the problem. Anyway, it's not for me to, not for, <laughs> not fair to say that in this platform. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, Nitin, uh, can you please? Uh, yeah. I am very sorry. There was an internet problem. Yeah, my question, I, again, if I repeat it again, I am a little worried about since there is only one, as a matter of right, I can only go to appeal only one. So that is a thing which is disturbing me a lot because I always have a more faith on a higher judiciary. And since the appellate court being a district, Court, there may be some issues may happen. I'll only uh, mention one thing about Mumbai city which I have come across. Uh, without applying the knowledge, now so many cases getting converted into commercial uh, case. For example, any movable, immobile property which is a residential property which is redeveloped into a building and that uh, cause was also converted into the uh, commercial cause wherein that particular property was a residential property not was used for a trade and commerce so these mistakes are getting happen and people they do not know anything and then they end up into the commercial uh, space and uh, remedy is little less that's only no, the there is no there is no remedy uh, yeah. 13 says 13 says that you cannot file a revision or an appeal Jurisdiction is something to be heard by the court only. So, so uh, you cannot really rush. Uh, it says no appeal or civil division petition under section 150. We lie from an order uh, finding that it has jurisdiction. So, so. Sir, constitution powers are alive. I am talking about SLP and uh, as you also said, 227 article. Mm, yes. That's right. That's what this uh, Ram said. That's to, that is what Justice Ram Kumar said. If you don't give a revision under 115, 227 floodgates are open. Till, till the judgment of the Supreme Court, nobody really crossed 226. Nobody knew that there was something called as 227 there. After that, now the most popular provision under the Constitution of India is actually 227. Uh, uh, George, sir, can you please tell us two judgments which you mentioned of uh -huh. Delhi High Court recent? Thank you, sir. Yeah, recent ones. Yeah. So there is one of uh, Justice Vipin Sanghi and one of Justice Hari Shankar. What I will do is I will, if uh, Sham sir has your contact details, I'll directly, or what I will do is I'll incorporate them in the slide before I send it out. Okay, I'll do one thing. That revised slide again will be circulated. That yeah, so the, the context, but those context of those judgments is in the context of the Delhi original side rules, where if an order is passed on certain aspects which the registrar has power to do, does that still ensure an independent of right of, of appeal, even though it's the commercial court side? That's the issue which was being considered. And in Delhi, we have some peculiarities. For instance, I don't know about the Bombay High Court. In the Delhi High Court, certain segments of the trial are not done by judges themselves. Because in the Delhi High Court, for instance, cross-examination of the witnesses, that actually happens before the registrars who are designated for that purpose in the Delhi High Court, who are all from the lower judiciary. So one, one of the issues which came up was that if an order is passed by a registrar on a certain application which he or she has the power to adjudicate, then Will an independent chamber appeal lie to a single judge as it always used to do? Or would that also be barred by 13 of the Commercial Courts Act? This was answered by saying that a chamber appeal is a distinct creature or a distinct entity and that would not be hit by Section 13. So as Justice Venkatesh said, there are a lot of confusions because of the way 13 is worded and each High Court is grappling with it in the context of its own rules and regulations. But these we will add to the slide and we will send it across. Thank you. We have uh, uh, Radha Krishna Murthy with a question. Radha Krishna Murthy, over to you. Yeah. <clears throat> By virtue of this uh, Amendment Act, that is 2018, whether this uh, statute has power to extend the time limit, what is, uh, uh, I mean, there in Limitation Act? You're talking because about the written statement. No, 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 not written statement. Actually, for filing of the thing, as per Section 12A of the Act, that is the Amended Act 2018, see, necessarily that day, if, if I am not seeking any urgent relief and all, necessarily I have to institute before the uh, Legal Service Authority. So, Legal Service Authority, whatever time that the Legal Service Authority has taken, 
that cannot be computed for i mean for filing of the case that's what the act says so if that be the case say for instance uh, today is the last date for filing of the recovery suit that is 3 years and once if i institute before the uh, legal service authority that cannot be computed that's what the, the act says so if that be the case it is nothing but extension of 3 more months or if the parties mutually they agree another 2 months so totally 5 months that they have power to extend award yeah so effectively what the the scheme of the act is that time which you spend on an alternative dispute resolution mechanism will be excluded in the reckoning of your timeline this is somewhat similar to uh, adr provisions which are pre arbitration mechanisms there are uh, there is this one judgment to the supreme court i'm forgetting which supreme court judgment explicitly says the time spent for mediation will be excluded when reckoning the limitation period for invoking arbitrary this i think is gore hari singhania versus singhania versus singhania family dispute so i think that same principle has been interlocuted here that you know the time you spent with that alternate resolution process is going to be excluded when in terms of computing the clock for limitation that period effectively is wiped out that seems to be the underlying principle yes no no they have i mean in that judgment and all actually that was within the time even after the time taken by the i mean legal service authority but say for instance just i am giving an example like last day of the limitation that is for 3 years for filing of the uh, recovery suit and all so once if i institute there so it is nothing but that the legal service authority whatever time that they have taken is extending over the limitation period is it correct it means that by virtue of this uh, amended 2018 act so the legal service authority or whoever it may be it is more than 3 years then is it permissible yeah my dear friend that's what i told you even in the beginning look how advocates think over it if an <laughs> at the time when 12a was drafted nobody would have contemplated a situation like this where you wait till the last day and on the last day what you do is you initiate a legal services authority for settlement so that you will get some 3 4 months time and this 3 4 months time you take advantage for the purpose of instituting or getting comfortable collecting all papers and then filing a suit see these are things you are technically right it requires a judicial pronouncement as to what you are saying now what will be the effect whether it can extend the limitation that has been provided under the limitation act is a good question that requires consideration but look at how we look at the way in which we are handling things here what prevented somebody from going to the court before time if he is really interested in initiating a pre institution mediation but that Why cannot, is he waiting till the no no for that uh, my answer is 1987 supreme court is there that uh -huh. they have clearly held why the litigant i mean litigant has approached the court at the last day and all it is not domain of the court correct correct so the, i understand i understand uh -huh. so therefore that's why initially i said it's possible that this is an interesting question which requires an adjudication i'm not saying no but see the way in which we think about it if it requires a mediation if it requires a real settlement between parties the party need not really wait till the last day i am not on the legal side of it i am on the attitude side of it that's what i'm saying okay thank you sajid da please unmute yourself and put the question yes i have just one doubt good i i hope i can yeah yeah or can hear yeah, yeah audible, audible. no the the thing is that uh, i do i have an option to file a commercial dispute before an ordinary civil court The the question is clear. The designated courts. I do agree, but do I have an option when I have a commercial dispute with me no. to file suit instead of commercial court? Can I move uh, civil court? Oh, I see. Or, That's the question. Or, 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 or rather, uh, the commercial court is a complementary jurisdiction to civil court. Well, I think if you fall within the definition. then in yes, terms yes. of section 15 the commercial court now is an exclusive jurisdiction or an exclusive forum to try all cases provided you also meet the specified value now if you are uh, you have a commercial dispute let's say it's 1.5 lakhs then to that extent one may say yes there may be you know an exclusive they may not be exclusive jurisdiction for the commercial court 
But if you fall within the definition, you also fall within the specified value. Then uh, Section 15 does mandate a transfer of that matter to the commercial. So there is the outside of jurisdiction of regulation. Yes. 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 Yes
right uh, because see the problem is that uh, the specific relief act carves out a special kind of uh, let's say category within an already specialized category of commercial dispute so that is the small difficulty and i think it's also as uh, justice venkatesh pointed out in a lot of these legislations if you see insolvency and bankruptcy code you see commercial courts act you see the 2015 amendments to the arbitration act a lot of these were brought in at a specific timeline now obviously the push for all of these actually was to improve rankings in terms of the economic standing in terms of the ease of business so the problem is a lot of these decisions were taken in a certainly to a certain extent in a knee jerk fashion without really totally being you know sure or holistically examining what would be the potential conflicts in the future or what would be areas which might overlap so uh, something so- somewhat similar with the specific relief act also because the amendments to the specific relief act were contemplated at a time when the commercial courts act possibly was not so fleshed out but despite the commercial courts act having now been articulated or let's say brought into effect you still have the specific relief fact which possibly could have been merged into the commercial courts act in terms of infrastructure again being set up so yeah so normatively there is a problem because there are lots of these statutes which have now come in which do have a certain semblance of overlap so of course the specific relief fact does have provisions specifying the kind of disputes you know which it very very categorically takes in But yeah, normatively, as and when the disputes arise, I'm sure you know, enterprising lawyers will obviously find you know uh, some overlap or depending on the scenario conflict. <laughs> and Mr. Amit, if you want man and to understand it well, right, sir. If you say tell it to him this way, he'll understand it better. Right. In a case, in a case involving Pokso, where right. there is an SCST offence also, right. which court it will go? He'll understand it better if you say that. <laughs> <laughs> sir as as i mentioned i have always already confessed to my section 138 background so <laughs> <laughs> so that is why i am not able to articulate it in that way amit uh, had it not been for 138 we would not have been civilized criminals <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to the end of the 72nd session of legal empowerment through interaction lecture series we were enriched uh, we were exposed to new thoughts and ideas and dr amit george you had impressed us last time you have impressed us even more this time and from is looking forward for more interaction with you because it has been wonderful and uh, we would like to take this opportunity to again thank jayman and bruce for introducing you to this uh, platform uh it was uh, i'd say a wonderful session and uh, the way in which uh, the stage was set and finally the curtains were arranged and the light was put on by mr anand venkatesh my god uh, it just just uh, took the entire presentation to a different level and uh, again wishing you happy birthday sir uh, we we are happy birthday, really, we are really privileged to have you in this platform and uh, i would say i will kingdom uh, uh, you to a promise that you will be back to take a session for us at least starting with one session be there uh, with us so that uh, we can have much more interactions and uh, i would like to thank uh, justice k ramachandran sir and in spite of his ill health being present this is v ramkumar sir and all of you wonderful persons thank you thank you very much till we meet again tomorrow for the thank session you. the 73rd session of justice sir uh, hari prasad sir on uh, an overview of uh, imposition acquisition and transfer of easement 330 tomorrow do take thank care you. let thank us you. Thank, you. thank you thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.